Okay. So shall we start? Shubham? Shubham? Shall yes. we start? Yes, we are live now, sir. Okay, fine. So good afternoon, dear students. Uh, this is FMG Marathon. So no repetitions here. And we'll be complete. Have to complete the entire important few important points in ENT within three hours of time. And uh, remember, things will not be repeated here. It's difficult to repeat, as well as you have to be a little bit fast. No taking, no notes, uh, no, no noting down of points. All those you can just follow. Annotated notes will be provided to you later. Fine. So shall we wait for two minutes? All the students, participants number increasing. So, okay. Let me wait for one to two minutes. We'll see. Okay, fine. So, <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. So, first, uh, we will start with the year part first. So uh, the key topics in the year for your FFG is first of all your now supply, right? Now supply of the Pinda and external lottery canal, Ramsey Hunt syndrome, Bell's palsy, and uh, you have your bone anchored hearing aids, mastoiditis. If you go into the external lottery canal, you'll be having malignant otitis externa. Going into the middle year, glomus questions were asked, questions on impedance, referred otalgia, otitis media with effusion, otosclerosis, right? Menias disease, cochlear implantation, vestibule of the inner ear, and on beta. So these questions were asked, key topics, and uh, so we'll be discussing one by one. First, coming to the pinna, you know pinna is entirely a single piece of yellow elastic cartilage, right? It's entirely a single yellow piece. You know the outer elevated margin is the helix, right? And here is your tragus, right? And uh, the deficit here, you call it as incisura terminalis. And also the C-shaped depression here, you call it as concha, right? The cartilages from the concha as well as tragus are used in as cartilage grafts in your middle ear surgeries, right? So this part, remember this part, entire cartilage is a single piece of yellow elastic cartilage. Now coming to the embryology, from which arches does your pinna develop? First and second. From the first and second arch, how many hillocks of his? Six hillocks of his will develop. From the first, you will be uh, the tragus will be developing, and the remaining part will be developing from the second arch. So, incomplete fusion between tragus and remaining part of the pinna will create a deficit uh, that you call it as a preauricular sinus. If you see, this is your tragus, and uh, this is your remaining part of the pinna. So, in between these two, you will be having your preauricular sinus developing. If this preauricular sinus is not getting infected, just an opening is there in front of the auricle. So, no need to do anything. If this is repeatedly, if and only if it is getting repeatedly infected, repeated, then you have to go for surgical excision of the tract. Okay. Now, moving on to the next topic anomalies, you know, anosia, complete absence of the pinna, microtia or pinna tear, ill developed pinna. And you know, uh, preauricular skin tags, right? Okay, pre these extra skin growths are called as preauricular tag. It is just like a tag, preauricular tag or skin appendages. Now, coming to the pinnaplasta, at which age you should do pinnaplasty? Anyone? At which age you should do pinnaplasty? Yeah, approximately six years of age. Why six years of age? Why six years of age? Because you are. Pinna attains adult size by the age of six years and also costal cartilage matures at by that age. One more reason is peer teasing. Okay. The your colleague, the student, the, the child colleagues may by six years of age they may become socially conscious and they may start uh, uh, teasing the child who do not have a pinna or a malformed pinna, right? So these are the reasons why pinna plastic uh, should be done by the age of six years. What is the other surgery you do by the age of six years? Maximum age limit for cochlear implantation. For cochlear implantation, in case of prelingual deafness, congenital deafness. In congenital deafness, for cochlear implantation, six years is the maximum age limit. Now coming to the next, hematoma of pinna. What happens here? Hematoma, huge blood accumulation in between the 
cartilage and its perichondrium. So what happens? Necrosis of the cartilage may happen here and necrosis of the cartilage may cause cauliflower if not treated promptly, immediately. So what is the immediate treatment for hematoma of pinna? Incision and drainage followed by pressure dressing. Why incision and drainage should be done immediately? To relieve the pressure so that necrosis will be avoided and that deformity can be avoided. Right. So this is about hematoma of pinna. So after incision and drainage followed by pressure dressing, you can put a him on systemic antibiotics further. Right. Now, coming to the question that was asked previously, 55-year-old woman presented at the hospital with a history of ear trauma. Okay, there was a history of trauma. In whom do you see this? Boxers, wrestlers, okay, where the pinna is more prone to get traumatized. There is absurd swelling, tenderness and discoloration already started. Necrosis was already started. So, which is false? It may lead to pugilistic ear. Yes, hematoma of pinna will definitely lead to cauliflower ear or pugilistic ear. It resolves spontaneous. No, it does not resolve spontaneously. Definitely, incision and drainage needs to be done and followed by pressure dressing to avoid reaccumulation of the fluid and then followed by systemic antibiotics. It is caused by accumulation of blood in perichondrial space. Yes, exactly. All cases should receive prophylactic antibiotics. Yes, definitely you should give antibiotics. So, the answer will be the second option, right? Now, coming to the narrow supply of the pinna, majority part of the supply, greater part of the auricle is supplied by greater auricular nerve. The name itself is speaking. So, greater auricular nerve supplies. On the medial side, it supplies majority portion as well as on the lateral side also, it supplies majority of the portion. The in between the conchal depression part, where is the, the conchal depression and its corresponding medial part, these surfaces are supplied by your facial nerve branches as well as vagus nerve branches. Right? Okay, you are getting now? You are following? So, this is a revision class, right? Okay. So, greater auricular supplies, majority part, conchal part is supplied by your facial and uh, this uh, vagus branches and anterior superior part is supplied by your auriculotemporal nerve, which is a branch of, mandibular branch of the trigeminal V3 branch, right? And this is lesser occipital nerve, right? A little bit portion on the medial surface above, right? So, this is about nerve supply. So, the major part of the auricle is supplied by greater auricular nerve. Conchi is supplied by facial and vagus branches. Remember these points. Now, coming to external lottery canal, is this uh, no more confusions? Remember, this develops from first cleft. So, no, no confusions, cleft, pouch, arch, no confusions. This is developing from first cleft, right? So, now coming on, you know the anatomy. It is a cylindrical canal like structure where your outer one third is cartilaginous and inner two third is bony. How to remember? See, to the central temporal bone, outside cartilage is attached, the pinna cartilage and the, the external lottery canal cartilage is attached to the to the same temporal bone inside the eustachian tube cartilage is attached. So, if you take, see, if you take your pinna, external lottery canal, tympanic membrane, middle ear, and, okay, this one, eustachian tube. So, if you take, this part is bony, right? Okay. So, this entire thing is bony part. Now, if you come to the external lottery canal part, it is outer one-third cartilaginous and inner two-third bony. And if you come to the eustachian tube part, this is outer one-third bony part and the inner two-third cartilaginous part. The length of the external artery canal is 24 mm. The length of the eustachian tube is 36 mm. So remember this much and you can apply this in your exam if asked. Okay. So the skin will be having various ceruminous, pilosebaceous glands, secreting wax, fissures of cytorrhini, foramen of Hushki will be there. And the 6 mm lateral to the tympanic membrane is the narrowest part that you call it as isthmus. Followed by medially, there is an anterior recess. If foreign bodies get lodged here, it is difficult to remove. Fine. Now, coming to the next one, swellings in EAC, what will be the most, what are the most common, sir? so what are the most common swellings you see in case of EAC? So, in the cartilaginous part, outer one-third cartilaginous part, if there is any swelling, it should be furunculus. Furunculus are nothing but your staphylococcal infections of the hair follicle. So, what will you give here? Anti-staphylococcal antibiotic. As it is an infectious process, patient will be having pain here. If you take the single large swellings that occur in the bony part, the inner two-third is the bony part. If there is a single large swelling here, you can see here a single large swelling. This is osteoma. Okay, osteoma. And if you see multiple small swellings, those are called as exostosis. So, these two are bony swellings and this occurs in the cartilaginous part. Clear? So, treatment for these bony tumors is only surgical excision. 
But whereas the treatment for your furuncal, treatment for your furuncal is anti-staphylococcal antibiotics, analgesics accordingly, right? Okay. Now coming, so exostosis is also most commonly seen in surfers where cold water, uh, the, where the people are more exposed to cold water. Otomycosis, what is the most common organism causing fungal infection of the external ear canal? Otomycosis, aspergillus nigra. How the aspergillus nigra appears? Black-headed filamentous growth, right? And the next most common is candida. Candida, whitish, yellowish, creamy deposit, right? So these are the two things. Patient will be having an itchy sensation. Sometimes discharge can be complained. Sometimes a musty odor will be complained by the uh, patients. So what you have to do immediately, if you see, uh, if you are seeing a uh, uh, fungal uh, debris in a ear canal, you have to first clean the ear canal, oral toileting, and then give antifungals. If you are seeing aspergillus, it's better you give itraconazole. If you are you see candida, it's better you give fluconazole. If you are seeing both, prefer itraconazole, right? Here, this is candida. Okay. So, I think, hope you are following. Yeah, wet newspaper appearance is also, right? So, this is about otomycosis. Clear? Now, coming on to the Ramsey Hunt syndrome. What is the causative organism here? What is the causative organism in Ramsey Hunt syndrome? Yes, varicella zoster virus. So, varicella zoster virus, where does this reside? Where it lies dormant? So chicken pox has come in the childhood, but the, the virus, the disease has gone, but the virus is still lying dormant in which ganglion? Geniculate ganglion. What is geniculate ganglion? Where your facial nerve enters the middle ear, it gives a ganglion immediately. Okay, where your greater superficial petrosal nerve enters, right? So that is your varicella zoster virus. And what happens when this infection occurs? Uh, when in the Ramsey Hunt syndrome, apart from, apart from pain, patient will be having pain in the ear as well as vesicles will be seen along the distribution of the facial nerve. Vesicles along the facial nerve distribution, isn't it? So where you will see, if you take your external artery canal, on the posterior canal wall, if you take the uh, ear canal, on the posterior canal wall, you will be seeing all the vascular eruptions, as well as you can see in the conca part, you all know the conca is supplied by facial and the vagus branches, as well as it can even spread a little bit uh, anteriorly along the facial nerve branch distribution. So, pain and the vesicles are typical of Ramsey Hunt syndrome. Sometimes even facial palsy can also be seen here. Okay, sometimes even SNHL can also be seen here. So, remember these points. A patient is presented with painful vesicles on ear and facial nerve palsy. Which of the following will be the cause of it? You know, Ramsey Hunt syndrome and geniculate ganglion is the cause of it, not the basal ganglion. Melkerson Rosenthal syndrome means alternating recurring facial nerve palsies. Gradenigo syndrome triad is seen in petrocytis, which is a complication of your CSOM, right? So this is uh, uh, related to Gradenigo syndrome. We'll discuss it later. Now coming to the malignant otitis externa, most common. If first of all, this is not malignant. Why it is called as malignant otitis externa? It behaves like a malignancy, right? So malignancy, behaving like a malignancy means it is locally invasive, right? So where do you see this most commonly? Elderly, diabetics, immunocompromised people, right? What do you see? You see a foul smelling discharge. Why foul smelling discharge? Because it is digesting, eroding the bone completely. So foul smelling osteomyelitic bone will be there. So that's why this condition is also called as skull based osteomyelitis, right? So discharge, foul smelling discharge will be there as well as a typically you will be seeing a granulation tissue. Whenever you come across in the question that there is a granulation tissue apart from discharge and severe pain and severe pain. So definitely in the external lottery canal, if these are the presenting features, definitely it should be malignant otis externa. The causative organism is Pseudomonas aeruginosa, right? Most common in elderly diabetics or immunocompromised people, right? What is the treatment now? You have to go for you have to go for anti-pseudomonal antibiotics like your septazidim, cefoperazone. So those you can go piperacillin and ciprofloxacin sometimes will work, right? So these are the uh, treatment options. Apart from these, you have a long-term treatment. Minimum of six weeks, you have to give treatment. And still, if it is not reducing, you have to go for surgical debridement. And uh, if you go for a gallium 67 scan in this case, it will show the soft tissue involvement. And if you go for a technetium 99 scan also, it will show you the how much amount of bone is involved, right? So this is about the malignant otitis external. So this is the question, 60-year-old diabetic, 
severe pain, otoria, not responding to antibiotics, granulation tissue, even facial nerve pulse. If the extension is deep enough and it is contacting the facial nerve, then definitely facial nerve palsy may also develop. So the likely diagnosis, you all know, this is malignant otitis externa. And you see this picture, this is a otomycosis picture. You can see the black-headed filamentous growth here, aspergillus niger, as well as the powdery, fluffy, whitish, creamy the deposits over here that is candida. So combined the uh, otomycotic uh, fungi are seen here. And this is serous otitis media. Through an intact tympanic membrane, you can see the sterile serous fluid inside the middle ear. This is serous otitis media. And this is the eczematous otitis externa, where the skin over the pinna is uh, eczematous. Okay, dermatitis of the... Uh, the external artery canal and the pinna skin, right? So this is about, and uh, coming to the next question, a patient was diagnosed with earwax, subjected to syringing. She was developed a syncopal episode. So uh, syringing is done in which direction? Syringing is done in which direction? Syringing is done in which direction? Yeah, posterior superiorly, very good. So posterior superiorly, you will be doing the syringing of the uh, external artery canal to remove the wax. So here, uh, sometimes, what is uh, which nerve is supplying the posterior wall? Your vagus nerve branches, uh, that is called as Arnold's nerve or Alderman's nerve, that is supplying the posterior wall. So whenever you are doing the syringing, if the tip of the syringe, the metal object, touches the ear canal, so sometimes the patient can have syncopal attack. So Arnold's nerve is the answer here. And uh, auriculotemporal nerve supplies the anterior superior part of the pinna, as well as anterior wall of your external artery canal. And Jacobson's nerve is nothing but it is a branch of the glossopharyngeal nerve. Jacobson's nerve supply middle ear mucosa. Okay. If you take your pinna, external artery canal, tympanic membrane, middle ear, right? So inside the middle ear, mucosal lining is there. This is supplied by your Jacobson's nerve, right? Okay. One of the causes for referred otalgia. Cough for scratching the external artery canal. Again, the same question. Cough. Again, vagus nerve branches, right? So, which is the vagus auricular or ulnar nerve branch of the vagus is the positive nerve here. What is the surgery done to widen the cartilaginous part of the external artery canal called? That is your meatoplasty. What is tympanoplasty? Repair of the tympanic membrane or middle ear. Okay. Repair of the middle ear. Meringoplasty, only tympanic membrane repair. Otoplasty or pinnaplasty, pinna repair. Right. Okay. Clear. Is it fine? Speed is fine. Right. Okay. Sure. So now coming to the tympanic membrane. So you know the normal anatomy of the tympanic membrane. Should I repeat? So it is a, a little bit oval shaped. What's the diameter? 9 to 10 mm. And horizontal diameter is 8 to 9 mm. 8 to 9, 9 to 10. And thickness is 0.1 mm. And uh, it is divided into uh, four quadrants based on the based on the Handle of malleus orientation. Okay. So it is divided into four quadrants. And what are the four landmarks you see on the tympanic membrane? One, two, three, four. You have to remember this one. Right. Okay. If you remember this one, one, two, three, four. What is one? Lateral process of the malleus. This is lateral process of the malleus. Two, handle of the malleus. Three, tip of the malleus. Four, cone of light. So these four are the landmarks. How to identify which side if it is, if the cone of light is at the 5 o'clock position, it is right side or left side? Right side. If it is at the 7 o'clock position, it is left side, right? Okay. Follow the line. If you draw a line along the handle of malleus and cone of light, which side it is seeing to? Right side. So this is right. In the left ear, if you draw along the handle of malleus and cone of light, it will be coming like this, okay? So... A left-sided facing is the left one. A right-sided facing is the right one. Likewise, also, you can remember. Hope you got it, right? It's up to you how you can remember. There are two methods, right? Okay. So, these are the four landmarks. Four landmarks is, the first one is your, okay, the first one, just a minute. So, the first one, are you able to see the laser pointer here? Okay. So the first one is the lateral process of the malleus. Second one is the handle of the malleus. Third one is the tip of the malleus, also called as ambo. And the fourth one is the cone of light. So these four are the four landmarks of a normal tympanic membrane. Now you move on to the perforations. This is the central perforation surrounded on all margins by past tensor. You know, 
your tympanic membrane is having a pars tensa part and a pars placida part. What is the difference between these two? Pars tensa is having three layers, pars placida is having two layers. And uh, what is the other difference? Pars tensa is pars tensa is surrounded by annulus tympanicus, thick and ligament. Your pars placida do not have the annulus ligament. And pars tensa, the name itself says tensa. It is tightly stretched. Pars flaccida, flaccid means it is loosely stretched, right? And what is this subtotal perforation? This is subtotal. So subtotal means where entire pars tensa is lost. Central perforation means a part of the pars tensa is lost and the margins are entirely surrounded by pars tensa tissue only. Whereas if you come to subtotal, entire pars tensa is lost. You can see the annulus margins here. Now coming to the another perforation, this is the marginal perforation. One side bony margin, other side pars tensa. So this is marginal perforation and this is attic perforation that occurs in the region of the pars placida. So these two are very dangerous perforations. Marginal and attic are dangerous perforations. They can lead to aticoantral type of CSOM or unsafe type of CSOM. Now moving on to the retraction. What are the features of retracted tympanic membrane? So what is the first feature of a retracted tympanic membrane? You cannot see a cone of light. Cone of light is absent. Whenever you are examining an eardrum, if you are seeing the cone of light, it should be normal. If you are not seeing the cone of light, then there should be something abnormal. So cone of light is absent, foreshortened, Handle of malleus, foreshortened handle of malleus. What are the other features? A dull looking tympanic membrane. And what is the other feature? Sickle shaped malleolar folds, right? So what are the malleolar folds? You can see where the joining of the pars placida and the pars tensa. Malleolar folds will be there. They will be sickle shaped here, okay? And tympanic membrane will be overall looking dull. Cone of light is absent and the handle of malleus is foreshortened. So these are the four features of a retracted tympanic membrane. So the question here is, what is the grade of the tympanic membrane retraction shown in the image? So for pars tensa, SAID has given a staging system. For pars flaccida, TOS has given a grading system. If you take a, see this is the handle of malleus. If you see from lateral to medial, if you go from lateral to medial, handle of malleus will be lying like this laterally. And it is attached to the head of the malleus. And this is attached to your incus uh, body. And incus long process will be down running like this and it will be touching to the stapes like this, right? If your tympanic membrane is becoming more prominent on the handle of malleus, a handle of malleus is becoming more prominent, that is grade one, okay? If your tympanic, mem if your tympanic membrane is retracting still medially and it is touching the incus, that is grade two. If you can see here, you can pro cl very clearly see the incus long process here. Not that means... The tympanic membrane has retracted here and it is touching the incus over here. So this should be grade two, right? And if it is still me uh, medially retracting and touching the uh, promontory area here, it is grade three. And if it is completely draping over the medial wall like this, that should be grade four. So these are the four grades given by said for past tensor retractions, just remember. And what are the features of tubercular otitis media? There will be multiple central perforations will be there. Discharge will be there sometimes false smelling and uh, what is the most important feature painless there is no pain okay in this per perforations right and pale granulations can be seen sometimes okay pale granulations can be seen tubercular granulomas so which of the following is a not a feature of tubercular otitis media so there won't be any earache to the patient okay multiple perforations you can see pale granulations false smelling ear discharge you can see in case of TB otitis media. You have to remember the point. Earache is not present in case of tubercular otitis media. Now moving on to the next middle ear. So middle ear is a cube shaped structure. There are three divisions of the middle ear. Epitympanum, mesotympanum, hypotympanum. How to differentiate? How to differentiate? So whatever the level of the middle ear present exactly opposite to the tympanic membrane. The part of the middle ear lying opposite to the level of the tympanic membrane, that you call it as mesotympanum and the upper one AP and the lower one hypo, right? So these are the three parts of the middle ear, right? Three divisions of the middle ear. The treatment, okay, fine. Treatment will be added to your blood, that's fine. Now moving on to the ossicles, there are overall three ossicles, you know, malleus, what are these? You know, malleus, handle of the malleus, neck of the malleus and head of the malleus. It is connected to body of the incus, short process, long process, lenticular process of the incus, and stapes, head, neck, posterior crura, anterior crura, foot plate. So if you take a uh, where from these uh, parts are being developing, if you take uh, the parts which are present in the epitympanum, 
okay the parts which are present in the epitympanum develop from the first arch the parts that present in the mesotympanum develop from the second arch except stapes foot plate foot plate develops from inner ear foot plate develops from inner ear otic capsule as a part of the inner ear, inner ear bone it develops okay clear so which part see if you take this head of the malleus neck of the malleus they develop from first arch body of the inca short process of the inca they develop from first arch if you take the uh, handle of the malleus and tip of the malleus they develop from second arch long process of the inca lenticular process stapes head neck and crura of the stapes all these develop from the second arch except your foot plate which develops from the otic capsule okay now uh, the question is identify the structure given in the image so it has a body it has a short process it has a long process what should it be it should be incus right so this is incus as whereas your malleus will be having a head a neck a lateral process and a handle of malleus right manubrium right this is malleus right and this is incus typical head and two crore you have stapes foot plate you are having and vomer is present in septum okay posterior inferior part of your septum vomer is present okay so now moving on to the next middle ear anatomy if you take the anterior wall of the middle ear what are the structures present on the anterior wall so what is this open tube this is your eustachian tube okay so eustachian tube opening will be present on the anterior wall as well as your tensor tympani uh, muscle will be originating from the anterior wall so these are the two parts you can see on the anterior wall if you see the lateral wall what do you, what do you mean by lateral wall See, this is pinna, auditory canal, tympanic membrane, middle ear, right? So, this tympanic membrane and the, lying, the bone lying above the tympanic membrane, this scutum. So, these are forming the lateral wall, isn't it? So, this is lateral, right? This is medial, right? So, here, this is a tympanic membrane here and scutum. So, lateral wall is formed by tympanic membrane and the scutum. Hope you are getting this. No confusion, no? No confusions, no? Clear, no? Everyone is able to follow, no? Right, right. Good. Okay. So, moving on. Anterior and lateral wall is over. And uh, now, we will move on to the posterior wall. What is the main structure you see on the posterior wall? That is your pyramid. What arises from the pyramid? Stapedius muscle arises from the pyramid. If you see, this is the pyramid. Right? Okay. And now, moving on to the medial wall. So, on the medial wall, what do you see? You see a promontory. Posterior superiorly, you see oval window. Posterior inferiorly, you see a round window. And this is promontory. Anterior superiorly, you will see a processes cochleariformis. So, these are the major structures. And if you go much posterior superiorly, there you are. Lateral semicircular canal bulge, you can see over here. Okay, clear? So, where do your facial nerve pass here? What is the pathway for facial nerve? It arises, it enters into the middle area, middle ear here. As soon as it enters, it gives a geniculate ganglion. From the geniculate ganglion, GSPN branch is given anteriorly. Facial nerve runs posteriorly, lying above the oval window and anterior inferior to the lateral semicircular canal. Then it touches the posterior wall now. Once it touches the posterior wall, it turns vertically downwards and it runs downwards on the posterior wall. Okay, clear? So this is about the medial wall of the middle ear. What is promontory formed of from inside? So what is inside to this medial wall? Inner ear. So basal coil of the cochlea forms a bulge over here. Basal coil of the cochlea forms a bulge over here. So that forms the promontory. Now moving on to the facial nerve pores. Already if you take the medial wall of the middle ear, right? If you take the medial wall of the middle ear, you have the promontory, you have the oval window, you have the round window here, and you have lateral semicircular canal over here. So your facial nerve, as soon as it enters, it gives a geniculate ganglion. It runs posteriorly backward and touches the posterior wall. So this horizontal segment, this horizontal segment is also called as tympanic segment, horizontal segment or tympanic segment. And here lies your processes cochlear reformis. Now tell me the landmarks of the facial nerve. See, to the if you see the processes cochlear reformis, your facial nerve is lying a little bit posterior superiorly. So processes cochlear reformis is one of the landmarks for facial nerve, right? It's facial nerve. And if you see the oval window and the facial nerve, oval window is lying below the facial nerve. So facial nerve runs above the oval window. So oval window is another landmark for facial nerve. And still posteriorly, if you go to the lateral semicircular canal, 
the facial nerve is lying anterior inferiorly so lateral semicircular canal bulge is also one of the landmark to identify the facial nerve and as you come to the posterior wall if you come to the posterior wall if you move on to the posterior wall okay so this is your medial wall and this is your posterior wall so as soon as it is coming horizontally as soon as it comes on the posterior wall it comes down vertically down so this vertical part is you know it is also called as mastoid segment of the facial nerve and uh, as it is going downwards at the level of the pyramid it gives a branch that is called as narrow to step areas after the going down below the level of the middle ear it gives another branch that re-enters into the middle ear that you call it as carta tympani narrow to step areas is responsible for stepidial reflex carta tympani is responsible for taste sensation in the anterior to third part of your tongue right okay clear yeah anterior to third part of your tongue now moving on to the next one so this is facial recess you all know what is facial recess so you know here your facial nerve is running horizontally and vertically downward here and uh, from here the cauda tympani is arising from here so if you take at the level of the middle ear here one triangle is formed here inside incus short process will be there so this triangle is called as facial recess so facial recess this is important in cochlear implant surgery posterior tympanotomy approach and through this facial recess if you see inside you will be able to see the round window okay so into the round window your cochlear implant electrode is inserted right so now this is your facial recess. so the boundaries of the facial nerve are the facial recess are medially facial nerve and uh, laterally quarter tympani nerve okay is this clear boundaries of the facial boundaries of the facial nerve clear right okay fine so you can see here see the facial nerve recess facial recess here see the facial nerve is running like this from the horizontal part and bending down is the vertical part and see quarter tympani arising again entering into the middle ear running between the malleus and the incus and in between them is a triangle form the medial border is formed by the facial nerve and the lateral border is formed by the quarter tympani now and you can see see inside if you see this is the round window area so the cochlear implant electrode is being inserted into the uh, round window right round window enters into the through the round window you can enter into the sinus sorry scalar tympani right now we will move on to the next one tuning fork test how do you interpret with the help of tuning fork test first of all what is the tuning fork test you will be doing Rinne tuning fork test. Normal is air conduction better than bone conduction. That indicates it could be normal, it could be sensory neural hearing loss. And if your Rinne is bone conduction better than air conduction, then it should be conductive hearing loss. This you call it as Rinne positive, this you call it as Rinne negative. Am I clear? So now what you will do, because Rinne positive is for both normal as well as SNHL, you are getting Rinne positive. Now you do the Weber. And Weber, if the Weber lateralizes to the normal ear, if the Weber lateralizes towards the normal ear, what does it mean? If the Weber is lateralizing towards the normal ear, what does that mean? What does that mean? Yes, SNHL. What does it mean? It means SNHL. If the Weber is lateralizing towards the poorer ear, which side the patient is having problem, that side if the Weber is lateralizing, that you call it, that, that side, so, a conductive hearing loss. See, if this side, the patient is complaining of right-sided hearing loss. Now, I have done the Rini. Now, I am coming to Weber. So, right side, the patient is having problem. When I do a Weber, what happens? If the sound is lateralizing towards right side, the patient is having right conductive hearing loss. If the Weber is lateralizing towards the normal side, left side, right side, the patient is having SNHL. Always the problem is in the right ear only. Remember, affected ear only. Okay. So, this is about Rini and Weber. And now we move on to the pure tone audiometry. I have told you a shortcut. If the two waves are adjacent to each other and they are in the upper part, that is normal. If they are separated by a gap and still lying in the upper part of the graph, conductive. If they are lying in the middle or lower part and no gap, it should be SNHL. If they are lying in the lower or middle part, separated by a gap, that should be mixed. This is the short form, of course, to remember overall here. Okay, now coming to the impedance. So what do you mean by A type of impedance? It is normal, 
AD, where do you see this AD? Ossicular discontinuity. And AS is seen in autosclerosis. And C is seen in retracted tympanic membrane. And B is seen in where there is fluid in the middle ear. Where do you see fluid in the middle ear? Otitis media with effusion. Or whenever there is a perforation in the middle ear, CSOM cases also, you will be seeing the uh, B type of curve, right? Now, moving on to the stepidial reflex, you know, how does stepidial reflex travels? First, the sound will go and enter into the cochlea, right? From the cochlea, which nerve carries? Eighth cranial nerve, isn't it? Vestibular cochlear nerve. Where does it go? Cochlear nucleus. The sound signals will go and touch the cochlear nucleus. From the cochlear nucleus, the signals will go towards the superior olivary complex. From the superior olivary complex, on both sides, facial motor nucleus, facial motor nucleus on both sides, the signal will go. So through the facial motor nucleus, what's the signal? To, to the Naruto stepidius. Naruto stepidius. Naruto stepidius. And what happens? Stepidius contracts. Isn't it? Stepidius contracts. So what is the pathway of the stepidial reflex? So sound signal entering into the cochlea. From there, the eighth cranial nerve, cochlear nucleus, superior olivary complex, facial motor nucleus, and stepidius. Okay, fine. So this is the pathway of your stepidial reflex. It protects your ear, inner ear from the loud sounds. It does not. When the stepidius contracts, what happens? It holds the stapes bone tightly. It does not allow the foot plate to go to go inside very fast and get dislocated into the inner ear. Okay. Whenever you hear a sudden loud noise like a firecracker, fire, firecracker bursting. Okay. What happens to the high sound? The step is tries to move with a larger amplitude. But if it moves with a larger amplitude, sometimes it may get dislocated and enter into your inner ear. To avoid that, the stepidial reflex is there. It will tightly hold the stapes and it will not allow the stapes to tie, go into the inner ear. Okay. Now, moving on to the autosclerosis. So, where do you see this most commonly? Females and it increases during the hearing loss worsens during pregnancy times due to pregnancy hormones, right? Okay. So, what is the most common site? Most common site, what do you call it as? Fistula antifenestrum, right? Fistula antifenestrum. And what is the most common type of photosclerosis you see? Stepidial, okay? Anterior to the oval window. If I'm taking the oval window, uh, with the stapes foot plate, which is fitted in the oval window. This is the stapes foot plate and it is fitted into the oval window with the help of the annular ligament, right? And uh, in the anterior part of here, where the, this area you call it as fissal antifenestrum, okay? Here, the extra bone deposition occurs and uh, that fixes the foot plate. So the vibrations of the foot plate reduces and that will cause conductive hearing loss to the patient. So this is the pathogenesis here. And uh, if you see in these cases, otosclerosis. So what happens? The tympanic membrane will be normal. The what will be the complaint of the patient? Only hardness of hearing will be the complaint of the patient. Tympanic membrane will be looking normal. Why? Because where is the problem? Problem is at the level of the stapes, right? Malleus, incus, and the stapes. So the actual pathology is near the stapes. When I'm looking from outside, the TM is normal, isn't it? The tympanic membrane is normal. So it looks normal. So you can see a squads sign. If there is an active process of photosclerosis going on over here. So what happens? I can see through the intact tympanic membrane. I can see the reddish hue that we call it as squad sign. And also on the bone conduction, if you go, if you do a puton audiometry test on the bone conduction wave uh, at 2000 hertz, you will get a dip uh, that you call it as Carhartt notch. Okay. At 4,000 hertz, if you are getting a dip, means that should be noise-induced hearing loss. Okay, clear? Now, we'll move on to the next. The primary para is being evaluated for hearing impairment, which has was sent during her pregnancy. Rini is negative in both ears. So, both sides Rini negative means both sides bilateral conductive hearing loss. Okay, don't get confused here. Both sides conductive hearing loss. Weber's lateralized towards right side means. So, right side, more amount of conductive hearing loss compared to left side. That is the interpretation here. A tympanic membranes appear normal because the process is the pathogenesis lies in the middle ear where stapes is fixed to the inner ear, right? So there's a tympanic membrane, there is no problem, absolutely. So audiometry shows a dip in bone conduction at 2000 hertz, Carhartt's notch. So this condition, you all know now it is autosclerosis. And what is the treatment of choice? See, many of you might be confusing in between the stepidectomy and stepidotomy. So if you want to follow the 
uh, the textbooks, you go for stepidectomy, but stepidotomy is preferable than stepidectomy. Why? Because in cases of stepidotomy, what happens? The graft dislocation, if you see, if I'm placing a piston here, the piston may get dislocated here. here in stepidectomy, I'm removing the complete stepis foot plate. Whereas in stepidotomy, I'm making a hole in the intact stepis foot plate. Through that for a small fenestration, I'm fixing the piston here. So no chance for the piston to get dislocated here. But in stepidectomy, the piston may get dislocated. I'm placing it like this, but later on it may get dislocated like this. So stepidotomy is always better than stepidectomy. Okay. Yeah, stepidectomy leads to false fistula say definitely. Yeah. So stepidotomy is preferable practically. Now coming to glomus tumor, this is a middle ear condition where a paraganglioma vascular tumor develops in the middle ear from the jugular bulb. It grows above. Okay, if you take your ear. Okay, so here is your jugular bulb like this, right? So from here it goes from below upward, the growth will be happening, right? So when you see from outside what happens, there is a it will be the reddish mass seen inside the middle ear rising from below to above. So that you call it as rising sun sign. Okay. Rising sun sign you call it as. Also seen other signs are you can see also an aquino sign here. You blanch the internal carotid artery on the other side. Compress the internal carotid artery and you can see the blanching of the tumor as well as tinnitus getting reduced. Here the patient will be complaining of hardness of hearing as well as tinnitus. Okay, so tinnitus will be there. So on examination, you can see a rising sun sign, reddish mass through the intact tympanic membrane. Am I right? Because here the tympanic membrane is intact. In the middle ear is filled with this glomus tumor, right? So tympanic membrane will be normal. But through the normal tympanic membrane inside, you can see a reddish mass, okay? So rising sun-like appearance you can see here. So that is your glomus tumor. Aquino sign can be seen. And tinnitus will also be pulsatile. It synchronizes with your heart rate. Okay, pulsatile tinnitus will be seen here. And uh, yeah, Aquino sign, blah, yeah. Phelps sign is not that. Phelps sign means that is seen on CT or MRI. And now see, a female presents with conductive hearing loss. So why conductive hearing loss in case of glomus? It is the tumor is occupying the middle ear. So any conditions in the middle ear, tympanic membrane, external artery canal will cause conductive hearing loss. Any conduction, any condition in the cochlea or auditory nerve will cause your sensory neural hearing loss. So on otoscopy, a red and bulgy mass behind intact tympanic membrane. So it is obviously a glomus tumor. So this is glomus tumor and this is serous otitis media. Here also the tympanic membrane is intact, but you can see a sterile fluid inside, right? In the middle ear, you can see a sterile fluid. Air fluid levels can be seen over here. In case of chronic otitis media, you should see a perforation as well as a mucopurulent discharge. So that is a typical Findings you see in case of a CSOM, a persistent permanent perforation and a pucopulan discharge. In case of photosclerosis, you will see a complete normal tympanic membrane, right? Okay. No, no, cartwheel doesn't come here. Cartwheel appearance is in ASOM. A 70-year-old male presents with neck nodes. 70-year-old neck nodes. Examination of left ear reveals a dull membrane, deafness and tritus. A type B curve is obtained. So a unilateral SOM, serous otitis media, in elderly, in elderly indicates a tumor in the nasopharynx. Most probably it could be nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Okay. So nasopharyngeal carcinoma could be a reason here. CSOM, you know, a permanent perforation. You see a permanent perforation as well as the discharge. And in case of glomus tumor, rising sign, uh, sun sign, reddish reflux behind intact tympanic membrane, you can see. A 35-year-old woman presents to you with complaints of difficulty in the hearing in right ear. Slowly progressive, tinnitus, pulsatile, right? So everything is there in the question. A reddish mass, reddish mass inside the intact tympanic membrane, audible bruit is heard over the mastoid. A rin in negative means conductive hearing loss is in means middle ear condition. So obviously this will be the, the problem here, right? Okay. So this is ASO. That what your uh, cartwheel appearance is seen in ASO. Okay. Now, moving on to the eustachian tube. So, a quick eustachian tube. No, you know, it develops from the first pouch, endodermal derivative. Now, eustachian tube, uh, the outer one third bony, inner two third cartilage, you all know very well. So, if you see the endoscopy, diagnostic nasal endoscopy picture of the uh, nasopharyngeal area, see, this is the opening. You see, this is the opening of the nasopharynx, the, the opening of the eustachian tube in the nasopharynx on either side. And you can see the elevation of the one side of the cartilage, cartilage of the eustachian tube protrudes into the uh, cavity 
by an elevation. This elevation is called as torus tuberius. And behind this elevation, you will see a depression that you call it as fossa of Rosenmuller, right? Okay. So this is torus tuberius. And the star marker is the fossa of Rosenmuller. This is the most common site for nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Am I right? And the a wall you are seeing behind is the posterior pharyngeal wall. Right? Clear? Okay. So, differences between adult and infant. So, adult will be 36 and infant will be approximately uh, half of that. Angle will be, it will be at an angle of 45 degree, but child one will be straight. You can see here, the adult is making an angle, the infant is almost straight. The lumen will be narrow, but here the lumen will be wide. Angulation at the isthmus is present, here it is absent. Cartilage in case of adults will be rigid. However, in case of infants, it will be obviously flaccid. So overall, if you take an adult eustachian tube will be present like this, or infant eustachian tube will be present like this. So this side, it is nasopharynx. This side, it is middle ear. So any infections in the pharynx side can easily spread into the middle ear and can cause otitis media episodes. That's why episodes of otitis media are common in case of children because in children, upper respiratory tract infections are most common and eustachian being short, a stout, broad, short, okay, and wide open, easily connecting to the middle ear. So easily infections can pass from the pharynx into the middle ear and repeated recurrent otitis media episodes can be happening in case of infants due to this reason. Now, moving on to the functions of eustachian tube. So, ventilation of the middle ear, that means on either side of the tympanic membrane, equalization of the pressure should be done and protection of the middle ear from the nasopharyngeal sounds and drainage of the middle ear secretions into the nasopharynx. So, ventilation, protection and drainage are the three functions of the eustachian tube. And if you see the patency test, these are done whether to see eustachian tube is functioning normally or not or it is completely like a blocked. So you do a Valsalva test, you ask the patient by closing the nose and mouth, and you ask the patient to blow out, the air will enter into the eustachian tube and it will enter into the middle ear. If the eustachian tube is open, then only the air will enter into the middle ear that will push the tympanic membrane outward. The outward pushing of the tympanic membrane, you can see with the help of an otoscope from outside. If the eustachian tube is blocked, that air won't enter and the tympanic membrane won't bulge outward. So that is Valsalva and Toyn B is completely reverse of that. So with closed nose, patient will swallow. So what happens? It will pull the air from inside the middle ear into the nasopharynx. So your uh, tympanic membrane should get retracted inward. So that retraction you should be able to see with the help of otoscope when the patient is swallowing with his nose closed. That is toin B test. With the Pulitzer bag, you Pulitzerization means you insert a Pulitzer bag. Same time, whenever the patient swallows, you press the Pulitzer bag. The air will enter the eustachian tube, goes into the middle ear. It will bulge outward. That you will see out from outside. Okay. So eustachian tube catheterization is also therapeutic also. Not only diagnostic, therapeutic also. Sonotubometry is being done nowadays recently. Now coming to the ASOM, the first stage, it is a stage of retraction, right? Or tubal block. Stage of retraction or tubal block. So what happens here? So tube gets, eustachian tube gets blocked and the negative pressure gets built up inside. So that retracts the tympanic membrane inside. And second stage is a pre-separative stage. This is in pre-separative stage, what happens? The blood vessels which are normally present in this manner, okay, blood vessels which are normally present in this manner, they due to the con constant pressure on the tympanic membrane, retracting negative pressure on the tympanic membrane, the blood vessels get engorged and they will be appearing more prominently now. They will be appearing like that of a cartwheel. So important question, cartwheel appearance of tympanic membrane is seen in case of ASOM, that too in pre-separative stage. So now the patient will be having a little bit of pain. So it will be still increasing uh, severity pain, gradually increasing in severity and uh, ear block sensation. Now, as you go uh, forward, what happens if they're still not treated properly, then the patient may have bacterial infection, bacterial invasion can occur. Bacterial invasion can occur and that can start forming the pus. And now apart from pain and the block, the patient will be also be having fever complaint and you can see a red dye, the bulging tympanic membrane outward. So what is causing this bulge? So the pus accumulation in the middle ear is causing bulge on the tympanic membrane. So from outside, you can see it as a red bulging tympanic membrane. So this is a stage of suppuration. Now this can lead into two stages. Either it can get complicated by forming a perforation here. So you can see a stage of complication. In stage of complication, uh, most commonly an anterior, anterior inferior quadrant perforation can occur. Okay, a perforation here, you can see here perforation. Once the perforation occurs, what happens? 
through that perforation, once the perforation occurs, whatever all the pus is accumulated inside, that will come out. So the patient will be typically complaining of pain first, followed by discharge next. Once the discharge starts, the pain will be reducing because pressure gets reduced here, pain gets reduced to the patient, right? Now, yes, what is your doubt? This is stage of resolution. Why aren't you responding to questions? So what is the question? What is Valsalva? See, doctor, this is a, I think this is marathon. No? I think uh, if we go on discussing in detail, uh, we cannot complete the, all the topics, right? Okay. Yeah, someone has written, force would exhale with closed nose and mouth is Valsalva. Okay. So it's a stage of resolution. You can see the congestion, entire tympanic membrane congestion is gone. Tympanic membrane is appearing normal. Still some sterile fluid is lying inside. So slowly once the eustachian tube block gets relieved, slowly, slowly the fluid will also get drained outward. So this is a stage of resolution, right? Okay. Clear. Clear. And uh, coming to otitis media with effusion. Okay. So what do you mean by otitis media with effusion? A serous fluid accumulation. Serous fluid accumulation in the middle ear. A serous fluid accumulation in the middle ear is a accumulation of serous fluid in the middle ear is a serous otitis media. Hope you are getting this, right? Difference between CSOM and complicated ASOM. See, in CSOM, the perforation will be permanent. Permanent perforation means the perforation margins are thickened and epithelialized so that they are not going, the perforation is not going to heal. So that is CSOM. In CSOM, uh, repeated on and off episodes of ear discharge and perforation will be there. Every time the patient comes to you with discharge, there will be perforation. Non-healing perforation will be there. But in case of ASOM, you will be having, it is a acute stage. And uh, after the, uh, the uh, anterior inferior quadrant, a small pinhole perforation will occur. And usually it will uh, resolve. The perforation will get closed later on. Sometimes this ASOM, they may complicate into uh, the acute mastoiditis and it can even uh, enter into the inner ear and it can even cause your labyrinthitis. Okay, so those complications can be happening. Okay, so that is your complications may occur here. Okay. Okay, so coming to the otitis media with effusion. Here, uh, uh, the, there is a serous fluid collection in the middle ear and that will be uh, causing the conductive hearing loss, right? Okay, the patient will be having conductive hearing loss. So the most common cause here mostly will be your adenoid hypertrophy in cases of children. Also, SOM is seen in where serous otitis media is seen in uh, which other condition? Unilateral SOM is also seen in nasopharyngeal carcinoma in case of elderly. Hope you remember that. And here in SOM, you will be seeing a fluctuating conductive hearing loss. Okay, remember this point. Fluctuating SNHL is seen in Meniere's disease. Okay, so remember this. And what is the treatment option for this otitis media with effusion? So most commonly in the anterior inferior quadrant, you give a radial incision and you insert a grommet. Okay, so meringotomy with a grommet. Meringotomy with a grommet. So what you are doing actually? So when you are putting a grommet over here like this, right? So you are draining all the middle ear fluid with the help of grommet, all the fluid is getting drained outward, right? So this is what slowly the grommet will automatically fall up after three to four months, right? So this is the treatment option you get in case of OME, okay? And also the causative, what is causing the OME here? That is also addressing that issue is also more important. If persistent adenoid hypertrophy, chronic adenoiditis is the cause, then you have to go for adenoidectomy along with the grommet insertion also, right? Now, see, a five-year-old child presents, five-year-old child presents with reduced hearing for the past two to three months. See, air fluid levels you can see. So, very clearly, it's a case of air fluid levels you are seeing means it's a case of serous otitis media. So, in case of meningitis bullosa, there will be multiple bullae-like appearance, right? Multiple bullae will be appearing here. That is meningitis bullosa. Their patient will be having acute pain, right? And acute otitis media, you can see a congested red bulge tympanic membrane or cartwheel tympanic membrane, you can see. Okay. So this is the, the next question. You see a child with delayed speech development. 
you see a child with delayed speech development as part of health visit and uh, at a local school the otoscopic appearance is shown below hearing loss of 20 decibels okay mild hearing loss the examiner wants to tell you that it is a mild hearing loss and what is your diagnosis again the same picture air fluid levels can be seen and uh, you can see as because why the child is having uh, delayed speech development here because auditory see uh, hearing is not normal so definitely speech development will be impaired so it will be a serious otitis media in case if it is has been asom the patient would have been complaining of pain and you would have seen a congested tympanic membrane or a bulging tympanic membrane if it has been a csom case you will be, you would be seeing a permanent perforation with a mucopurulent discharge if it is a glomus tumor you can see an intact tympanic membrane with a reddish mass inside right okay okay so now coming to cholesteatoma how many types of cholesteatoma are there acquired and congenital so first of all you know what is cholesteatoma the epithelial tissue which has to be present in the outside outside of the tympanic membrane if by any reason it goes inside into the middle ear and it forms a cholesteatoma there okay ectodermal derivative in a endodermal area see your external artery canal is lined with the squamous epithelium isn't it squamous epithelium if by any chance this squamous epithelium goes inside and lies in the middle ear so this is called as cholesteatoma okay simple so now there are two types of cholesteatoma acquired and congenital in acquired you have primary and secondary so what do you mean by primary and secondary secondary primary means no pre existing perforation is there no pre existing perforation cp means perforation no pre existing perforation is there here secondary means through a pre existing perforation the outer epithelium goes inward into the middle ear that is secondary okay secondary acquired hope you got it so primary acquired hope you have heard about witmax retraction pocket theory so what is this witmax retraction pocket theory so through for the outer epithelium the outside epithelium if this is your tympanic membrane the outer epithelium the tympanic membrane will get retracted inward and this uh, retraction this will be forming like a retraction pocket see this is your tympanic membrane right normal tympanic membrane so when there is a negative pressure constant negative pressure what happens at the weaker area the tympanic membrane will get retracted like this first of all a small pocket forms then it forms into a big pocket with a narrow neck now what happens all the keratin will get accumulated over here right okay because this is a keratinizing type of epithelium isn't it right so this is retraction pocket formation here there was no perforation earlier so this is primary right so witmax retraction pocket explains primary acquired cholesteatoma if you say the haberman's epithelial invasion haberman's epithelial invasion theory what does it say through a pre existing perforation if this is there is a perforation existing and the outward epithelium enters inside through this perforation through this perforation if the epithelium enters inside that is Haberman's epithelial invasion. That is secondary acquired cholesteatoma. And in congenital cholesteatoma, what is the future? Main future you see, TM will be intact. Are you getting this? Are you able to follow? You're able to follow, no? Fine, fine. Okay. Clear, yeah, right. Okay, name is misnomer. Yeah, that you know all. Name is misnomer, obviously. So, the congenital, your tympanic membrane will be intact and uh, in the antero superior quadrant, you will see a whitish yellowish, whitish yellowish mass, right? That is congenital. And now coming to uh, types of cholesterol over. Now, we'll uh, CSOM, you have two types, tubotympanic. We already uh, studied uh, your central perforation, subtotal perforation will lead to tubotympanic, marginal, attic, may lead to atticoantral type. So your tubotympanic type is a safe type of CSOM and atticoantral type is an unsafe type of CSOM because here complications are more and vital structures are nearby. Vital structures are nearby, okay? And here complications are less and vital structures are far away, right? So this is the difference. So in case of uh, tubotympanic, most probably, you, most commonly, you go for a simple tympanoplasty or canal wall up mastoidectomy. 
In case of anterior, you most commonly go for a canal wall down mastoidectomy. Okay, right. So, any doubts here? No doubts, no? Actico adult, yeah, likewise also you can remember, clear. So, now move, coming to treatment of CSOM, the treatment of choice is always surgical, okay? So, surgery is a must in CSOM cases. So, now moving on to the meringoplasty, what is, do you mean by meringoplasty? Repair of the tympanic membrane. If there is a simple perforation and the middle ear is entirely normal and your mastoid is completely normal on CT scan, then you may go for a simple meringoplasty and this simple meringoplasty is of two types underlay and overlay so as per dingra if underlay means if the graft is placed below the level of annulus middle layer below the middle layer if you are putting below the annulus if you are putting the uh, graft that is underlay and you are putting the graft above the annulus that is your overlay what is the graft used here Temporalis fascia or tragal perichondrium you will be using here. So that is the difference between underlay overlay. So only annulus is the differentiating point here. Above the annulus, overlay. Below the annulus, underlay. And now moving on to the ossiculoplasty, you may use partial ossicular replacement processes or you can use total ossicular replacement processes. See, if there is only incus long process is absent here. Here, along with incus long process, tapis suprastructure is also absent here. So total the replacement you will do here, partial replacement you can do here. So that is with the help of ossicloplasty. So you reconstruct the ossicles, simple. And now coming to canal wall up, canal wall down. So what exactly is this procedure? See, you know, this is your external auditory canal, right? Straight behind it, what is there? Your mastoid cavity is there, right? Okay. So if you are keeping this wall intact, I'm removing all the entire mastoid air cells and making it as a simple cavity. And uh, so I'm keeping the wall intact, this common partition wall intact, that is canal wall up, canal wall up. If I am removing this wall, I'm joining the post mastoidectomy cavity with the external artery canal, okay? Here, this wall is removed, downed, this wall is downed. So that is canal wall down procedure, clear? Okay, so what happens here? The normal migration mechanism is lost in canal wall down procedure. So. Now and then frequently debris starts getting accumulated, wax, debris, everything gets accumulated here and patient has to be on regular follow-up and he has to get the debris cleared every six months like that. He has to get it cleared. But in case of canal wall up, it is not required. But what is the advantage you get in canal wall down is entire tissue, entire cholesteatoma can be removed very clearly. But here, chances of a residual disease, leaving over residual disease are more in case of canal wall of procedures okay clear so these are the basic differences that you find between up and down procedures now please identify the retractor depicted in the image so all four pronged teeth on either both sides that is your mollison's mastoid retractor and this is jaws retractor here you can see this is perkins mastoid retractor you can see a blade soft blade and only three blades on one side that is perkins retractor and this is langenbeck's retractor and now coming to the wolstein's five types of tympanoplasty. So type one tympanoplasty is where the graft is placed on the malleus, right? And type two tympanoplasty is, uh, sorry, type two tympanoplasty is where the graft is placed on the incus. And type three tympanoplasty is where the graft is directly placed on the stapes, right? This you call it uh, also called as columella tympanoplasty or you also call it as meringostepidiopexy, okay? Meringo means tympanic membrane. Stepidio means stapes, pexy. You are joining the tympanic membrane graft with the stapes. And the number four is your cavum minor. So this is your number four, where you are creating a minor cavity and that cavity is directly contacted with the outside and the air you are creating in such a way that the sound waves directly strike on the oval window. So this, this is called as cavum minor, right? The sound waves are directly striking on the oval window here. On either side, you put the graph of the oval window, you put the graph. And in case of, and in case, this is the type 5 tympanoplasty where on the lateral semicircular canal, you make a fenestration first and you attach the graph there. The sound will go into the inner ear through the lateral semicircular canal. So this fifth one, you call it as fenestration tympanoplasty. Yes, someone is asking a doubt. So that is in CSOM, yes, where whatever the, uh, problem looks like whatever the complications are present accordingly you take a call okay 
So sometimes on table, you, there will be surprises. You will be seeing uh, some uh, deformities there. So accordingly, you will go for the surgical procedures, right? So overall, so little slow, but uh, we cannot uh, complete the full thing. Okay, so now see, match the following. See, so <clears throat> if you see the type two, so type two directly placed over the incus, type three, columella tympanoplasty, type four is cavum minor, type five is fenestration, right? Now coming to the complications of CSOM, you have mastoiditis. So in mastoiditis, uh, what features you can see? You can see the sagging of posterior meatal wall. So if you see the posterior meatal wall, see how the posterior meatal wall is pushed uh, towards the canal side. So this you call it as sagging of the posterior meatal wall. And here you can also see a lighthouse sign sometimes, lighthouse sign. If the discharge is active, okay, the pulsatile discharge will be flashing in front of you when you are, you are seeing inside the tympanic membrane. So it will be, light will be appearing and uh, or going off, appearing and going off. So that is called as lighthouse sign. You can also see a reservoir sign here. The discharge, whichever you remove from inside, again, the fresh discharge gets and comes and it gets accumulated over there. So as, as much as you remove out, a fresh discharge keeps on coming and getting accumulated over there. So that is reservoir sign and lighthouse sign, you know. So these two are seen in acute mastoiditis cases. So the abscesses, sometimes it can lead to abscesses on the mastoid area. So this is a post-auricular abscess, which is most common. Most common abscess in case of a complicated abscess in case of mastoiditis is post-auricular abscess. If not treated promptly, what happens? It can burst and the pus may get drained out and it can lead to a permanent mastoid fistula can form. Okay, just remember. So these are the features you can see in case of acute mastoiditis. In which condition is the reservoir sign seen along with mastoid tenderness? Okay, acute mastoiditis, right? So, if you want to see the lighthouse sign, can you see the lighthouse? You can see here, you can see the light flashing, you can see the light flashing over here, discharge, pulsating discharge, okay? Hope you are able to see that, right? Are you able to see that? Okay, so that is lighthouse sign. Fine. Okay, so coming to the other abscesses apart from post auricular, which is most common. So this is post auricular, you see. Other abscesses you see is zygomatic abscess, and the other one you see is bejold abscess, and even your sitelli, which occurs in the occipital bone, and intrameatally, within the meatus, within the canal, if it appears, that is looks abscess. So what is we mean by this bejold abscess? See, the pus, this is the mastoid bone. The, from the mastoid, the pus gets drained down below the mastoid tip and it will get accumulated in between the sternocleidomastoid and the digastric muscle and the angle of mandible. So in this area, the pus, the pus gets accumulated and it forms an abscess over here in a complicated case of CSOM. So that is your bejold abscess, right? And if it is involving the facial nerve, facial palsy can be seen. A person who met with an accident, a person who met with an accident, here it is a traumatic pathology not infective pathology, presence with the following finding. So a bruise over the mastoid area in a case of trauma case is always a battle sign. So don't get confused if it is infectious. Abscess means there should be infectious history, not traumatic history. Mastoiditis is also an infectious. Uh, Griesinger sign is seen in sigmoid sinus thrombosis, which is also a complication of CSOM. Right? Okay, so all this you know. Now we'll move on to the petrocytis. So what you will see here, Sorry. So what you will see in petrocytis? Gradenigo striad. Okay. Gradenigo striad. What are those three D? So one D is here. What is this now? Sixth cranial nerve, which runs near the petrous apex. And uh, this sixth cranial nerve infection causes diplopia. And uh, what is this ganglion? Michel's ganglion. Fifth cranial nerve, Michel's ganglion. Infection in this area will cause a a deep seated retro orbital pain. A deep seated uh, retro orbital pain. Right? And uh, of course, the patient is already having ear history, ear infection. So, discharge will be there. So, gradening osteoid will be having these three days. So, remember this point. This is seen in petrocytis, which is a complication of CSOM. Okay? And extra abdural abscess, subdural abscess, you know, once the, the 
uh, the infection, the CSOM, the pus erodes the tegment tympani or the roof of the middle ear. The next it will enter into the intracranial space. So if it is not breaching the dura, lying in between the tegment and the dura, it is extradural. If it is breaching the dura and going still inside, innerward into the cerebrum, then it is subdural abscess uh, and it can cause all the meningeal layers infection. Meningitis can happen. So you can see Kernick sign and Brzezinski sign. What is Kernick sign? On a hip flex at a hip, if you try to extend the knee, what happens that will cause a pain to the patient. And uh, when a Brzezinski sign is, if you try to flex the neck, uh, automatically the legs will get flexed. So that is Brzezinski sign. Right. So these are seen in meningitis. And coming to sigmoid sinus thrombosis, see even posterior to the mastoid, if you come posterior to the mastoid, you can see the sigmoid sinus running over here. So uh, even after it is, if it is not treated properly, so then the mastoid infection can spread on to the sigmoid sinus, which is lying posterior to the mastoid in the posterior cranial fossa. Right. So what happens here? The mastoid infection here from here can spread into here. There is a small vein connecting in between that you call it as a mastoid emissary vein. Mastoid emissary vein will be present. Okay. Mastoid emissary vein will be present. So here thrombosis here will form. What happens? A sign called erythema over this area that you call it as Griesinger sign. Right? Clear? And also inside the segment sinus also slowly thrombus starts accumulating and it will impede the flow of the central venous drainage. So central venous drainage flow is impeded by obstructing a one of the major venous sinus. One of the major drainage, venous drainage is affected. So retrograde congestion in the cerebrum will happen. That will cause headache to the patient and the increased intracranial pressure symptoms will be there to the patient. And uh, to check this, there are few tests, Tobey air test and Crowbeck test. Tobey air test, what he told, he connected, a, he did a lumbar puncture, he connected a manometer. He uh, obstructed, he uh, compressed the affected side. There won't be any change because already the thrombus has formed in the affected side and the drainage of the venous drainage has already got affected. So even if you compress this or if you don't compress this, there won't be any change in the pressure. But if you compress the normal side, now you are impeding the flow on the normal side also that leads to retrograde even more congestion and that will increase the pressure in the manometer that is connected through lumbar puncture. So what Crowbeck said is that Instead of doing a lumbar puncture invasive procedure, just do a fundoscopy and through the fundoscopy, check for the retinal vein engorgement. If the retinal veins are engorging, then definitely there is increased intracranial pressure. So there is a non-invasive procedure. And what else you see in case of sigmoid sinus thrombosis? Griesinger sign, remember this point. And also delta sign. Okay. So delta sign is also seen in case of uh, your uh, on CT or MRI of your sigmoid sinus thrombosis. So what is absent in a case of otitis media? In a case of otitis media, you know, visual abscess can be formed. Sigmoid sinus thrombosis can form Griesinger sign, but battle sign is a feature of traumatic uh, bone fracture, mastoid fracture. Delta sign is also seen in sigmoid sinus thrombosis. So this is battle sign and you see this is a visual abscess here. Okay. And uh, this is a Griesinger sign and this is delta sign CT on MRI triangle sign. Right. Okay. Clear? Any doubts? No, no. Fine. So everyone is following, no? Okay. Now, so moving on to the next question. A patient with a history of chronic ear infection presents with the fever, headache, vomiting, irritability, and confusion. CT brain is shown in the image below. So which area, the, which lobe is this? Temporal lobe. So the patient is clearly presenting with the uh, temporal lobe abscess. So all the increased intracranial pressure symptoms are being seen. Fever, headache, vomiting, irritability, confusion. Right? So, always a CSOM will lead to an abscess in the temporal lobe area. Now, moving on to the inner ear. So, from which of the following structures does the saccule develop? So, first of all, you should know the anatomical orientation. If you take the anatomical orientation of the inner ear, cochlea will be lying. Say so this is anterior, this is inferior, this is superior, and this is posterior. And this is connected to your vertically arranged saccule like this. And saccule is arranged to your horizontally arranged utricle like this. And uh, above here are your semicircular canal opening into the utricle, right? So these are your semicircular canals. So now if you take, a, if you draw a line over here, the cochlea, the cochlea and the saccule, cochlea 
and the saccule uh, these two develop from pars inferior and the utricle and the semicircular canal they develop from the pars superior so from which structure saccule develops is from pars inferior not from pars superior okay there is no word like saccular saccular portion okay so now moving on to the next question uh, next topic anatomy you know inner ear anatomy it's like a shell in a shell kind of appearance outside bony labyrinth inside exactly in that same orientation membranous labyrinth okay in the bony labyrinth which is the fluid field in the bony labyrinth which is the fluid field what is the fluid field in the bony labyrinth what is the fluid field? yes perilymph in the perilymph which structure is hanging which structure is hanging in the endolymph membranous labyrinth in the membranous labyrinth what is there in the membranous labyrinth what is there endolymph is there very good so this is how you are so you know you all know the anatomy right very well so you can easily understand everything now now see so uh, you know already we have discussed the main anatomy you have if you take the bony thing you will be having a bony cochlea bony cochlea is connected to the vestibule bony vestibule and bony semicircular canals and inside this bony part you will be having a membranous part and that membranous part will be having a membranous part of your cochlea what is the membranous part of your cochlea it is also called as cochlear duct right cochlear duct or scala media right okay this is connected to in the vestibule inside the bony vestibule what are the membranous structures present saccule saccule is connected to utricle right saccule and utricle inside the bony semicircular canals you are having bony uh, membranous semicircular canals right okay so these are the parts of your membranous lab then. now moving on to the scalar media if you see the cross section of the cochlea you will be having three chambers inside okay if you take so you will be having two membranes that is middle one is a scalar media which is nothing but your membranous labyrinth part. So this is separating the bony part into two chambers, scalar vestibuli and scalar tympani, right? So what is this membrane that is partitioning between the vestibuli and uh, media? This is Reissner's membrane. And the membrane that is partitioning between the scalar media and scalar tympani is the basilar membrane. If you take the basilar membrane, on the basilar membrane, you are having a structure. What is the structure? Organ of corti. So in the organ of corti, what are there? Outer hair cells and inner hair cells. Outer hair cells are arranged in three to four rows. Inner hair cells are arranged in one row. So obviously outer hair cells are more in number. And uh, outer hair cells will be resting on some supporting cells also. And also if you take the cochlea from the base towards the apex, if you go, the basal coil is concerned with hearing high frequencies and the apical coil is concerned with, is concerned with hearing of lower frequencies. The range of frequencies which the human cochlea can hear are 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. Remember this point. So the apical part will be hearing the lower frequencies. Basal coil will be hearing the higher frequencies. Okay. Remember this point. Now moving on to the next one. So this is what you are already we have discussed. Outer hair cells and inner hair cells present on the basement membrane, a basilar membrane. Now see this question. A 70 year old male presents with decreased hearing in higher frequencies. Higher frequencies means basal coil. It was noted that basilar membrane was affected. Which of the following structures lie near the affected? So near to the basal coil, which structure is present? Oval window is present. Helicotrema is present towards the apical coil. Whereas your oval window is present towards the basal coil. That is what your promontory. The promontory is formed by your basal coil. Exactly posterior superior to your promontory, oval window is present, right? So the answer will be oval window. Now coming to the autoacoustic emissions. What are the autoacoustic emissions? Whenever uh, the sounds are going inside, what's happening? Whenever the sounds are transmitting inside, what is happening? So whenever I am giving a sound, the sound is going and striking the tympanic membrane. The tympanic membrane vibrates. All these vibrations are carried through the ossicles into the inner ear, right? So whenever the tympanic membrane vibrates, all the ossicular chain vibrates and the foot plate vibrates and these vibrations are sent into the inner ear, right? So whenever the vibrations are sent into the inner ear, what happens? You know, if you take the cross section of the cochlea, here this is the basilar membrane. So there are the fluid will vibrate here. So what does that do? That will vibrate the basilar membrane. So when the basilar membrane vibrates, what happens? 
outer hair cells are present here, inner hair cells are present here. These outer hair cells will also vibrate, right? So the vibrations of these outer hair cells will produce a low intensity sounds. Will produce a low intensity sounds. Low intensity sounds produced by outer hair cells. So these are called as autoacoustic emissions. You know that, right? Hope you all know that. Okay. So autoacoustic emissions. What is the essence of autoacoustic emissions? If autoacoustic emissions are there, that means the cochlea is functioning normally. So to test the cochlea functioning, autoacoustic emissions, auto hair cell functioning, uh, autoacoustic emission test is done. And uh, it is one of the tests that is done for congenital hearing screening. Okay. It is done for congenital hearing screening. Clear? Okay. Apart from beta, you can also use this. And coming to autotoxicity, if you take there is a rich vascular layer in the this scalar media that you call it as stria vascularis here in this area, stria vascularis is there. So stria vascularis is damaged by some diuretics. What are those diuretics? Furosemide, bumetanide, ethacranic acid. Also your anti-malarials like chloroquine, chloroquine, quinine, chloroquine will damage this. Your outer hair cells, here are your outer hair cells. These outer hair cells are damaged by your platinum compounds, cisplatin, carboplatin, nitrogen mustards, and also your aminoglycosides. What are the aminoglycosides? Neomycin, carnamycin, cisomycin. Okay. And uh, what are the drugs that cause damage to the sensory structures in the vestibule and semicircular canals? Okay. In the semicircular canals, you are having a crista, and uh, in the utricle and saccule, you are having macula. So these are damaged by structures, the, by drugs. Those drugs are your aminoglycosides like, which will cause gentamicin, yes, gentamicin, tobramycin, streptomycin. So when the hair cells in the vestibule and semicircular parts gets damaged, the patient will be having complaint of giddiness. If the outer hair cells and striavascular is getting damaged, patients will be having sensory neural hearing loss. But if the patient, the uh, hair cells in the, uh, the vestibule part and the semicircular canal are getting damaged, the patient will be having giddiness. Streptomycin is a second line ATT drug, ATT drug, anti-tubercular therapy drug. So whenever those patients who are on streptomycin will present to you with this giddiness, okay? So clear, no? Are you able to revise this? Okay, clear, no? You are able to recollect everything, no? Yeah, good. Sure. So coming to the physiology, I don't want to, like you all know. So cochlea already, you know. So coming to the saccule. So you have vertically arranged a macula over here. And saccule is connected to utricle, which is horizontally arranged. And macula are arranged horizontally here. So saccule, utricle, and there are semicircular canals over here, right? So they will be having an ampullated end, right? Ampullated end, where your crista will be lying, right? So what is the macula, uh, the macula here in the saccule, in the saccule, which are lying vertically, the saccule is concerned with linear acceleration that to vertical movements because the macula are arranged vertically. If you take utricle, the macula are arranged horizontally. So here also, utricle also arranged, uh, is associated with the linear movements, but with horizontal movements. So horizontal linear accelerations are done by utricle. Vertical linear accelerations are done by saccule. Like going in a lift up and down is the movement is detected by saccule. Uh, going in a vehicle forward and backward is detected by your utricle. In the semicircular canals, the angular movements of your head, like these angular movements are detected by semicircular uh, canals, right? So, which of the following is correct about function of the utricle and saccule? So, utricle and saccule are concerned with linear acceleration. You know, utricle is with horizontal and saccule is with vertical, right? Hearing high frequency sounds is basal coil of the cochlea. Hearing low frequency sounds is apical coil of the cochlea. Angular acceleration is with semicircular canals. Okay, clear? Now coming to nerve supply, you know, you just draw a line from here, you will understand. So down lying the cochlea and the saccule, 
these are supplied by i mean uh, the saccule cochlea you know it is supplied by your cochlea nerve obviously and coming to the saccule and the posterior semicircular canal so these two are supplied by inferior vestibular nerve you know they are lying inferiorly whereas your lateral semicircular superior semicircular and the utricle all these are lying superiorly so these three are supplied by superior right so it's just the anatomical orientation you need to remember cochlea saccule utricle semicircular posterior superior lateral so if i draw a line from here what happens the lateral semicircular lateral semicircular canal and the superior lateral and the superior and also the utricle so these are supplied by superior vestibular nerve your posterior semicircular canal and the saccule these are supplied by inferior vestibular nerve and now here comes the cochlear nerve right so these three will combine to form a vestibular cochlear nerve right so you all know this uh, see if you know the anatomical orientation it will be easy to remember in this internal auditory canal how the nerves are arranged see there are four quadrants right okay there are four quadrants okay this is anterior posterior superior inferior if you take the anatomical orientation here see the anatomical orientation of the inner ear anterior inferiorly the cochlea is located so obviously into the anterior inferior quadrant the cochlear nerves will be entering this is the internal auditory canal here so into the anterior inferior part of your internal auditory canal the cochlear nerve will be entering so here it will be cochlear now now if you come to the posterior parts so below posteriorly you have both the vestibular nerves inferiorly inferior vestibular nerve and superiorly superior vestibular nerve so these three superior vestibular inferior vestibular cochlear all these three will join to form a vestibular cochlear and the leftover quadrant is anterior superior so that is occupied by your facial nerve so that how you can that's how you can remember easily clear no no cochlear so vestibular nerve vestibular nerve inferiorly inferior superiorly superior the leftover one is facial nerve if i take the anatomical orientation this is lying anterior inferiorly saccule utricle lateral uh, posterior semicircular canal lateral and superior are lying like this see if i take uh, from here it is entering into the this one so this is lying posterior isn't it the vestibule this part is lying posteriorly the vestibule part is lying posteriorly cochlea part is lying anterior inferiorly so into the infer anterior inferior quadrant cochlear nerve will enter so posteriorly into the both quadrants vestibular nerves will enter into the inferior part inferior vestibular superior part superior vestibular will enter so the remaining anterior superior quadrant will be supplied by facial nerve clear now auditory pathway you can remember with this mnemonic right okay crest commune someone wants to know about the crest commune see what happens to the utricle see into the utricle it is supposed that three semicircular canals should open with three uh, with their six openings but uh, what happens here is your posterior present posterior uh, as well as your superior and lateral will be of course like this the non ampullated ends of the non ampullated ends of the posterior and superior will join to form the crust commune remember that okay so that utric into the utricle semicircular canals open with the five openings crista function is detection angular acceleration those are the sensory structures lying in the semicircular canals ampullated ends of your semicircular canals they will detect your angular movement okay so arrange the following in the sequence of auditory pathway you know see first of all you may be wondering what is this spiral ganglion how is your cochlea arranged spirally right so all the nerves will be uh, from all the areas all the nerves will be going and they will be first forming in a spiral manner okay and that will continue as a cochlear nerve so before first first the uh, part of the nerve that is formed is a spiral ganglion then that is entering into your cochlear nucleus uh, and uh, then you you can follow your e colima just remember that okay what don't get confused with the spiral ganglia now moving on to the beta is nothing but you all know this e colima right 
So whenever you give a sound stimulus, your sound is supposed to travel through these parts into the auditory cortex. Am I right? So it is supposed to pass through this auditory pathway. So in beta, what I'm doing, I'm putting electrodes and checking whether that sound is correctly passing all through these areas or not. So for each part, I will be give, getting one wave in the beta. So if I see, so for beta purpose, you have to remember this code. See, the proximal part of the eighth nerve will be forming the first one, whereas the distal part of the eighth nerve will be forming the second wave. So this is the first wave, second wave. Third wave is formed by your cochlear nucleus. Fourth wave is formed by olivary complex superior. Fifth wave is formed by lateral lemniscus and sixth wave inferior colliculus. You will also get a seventh wave also that is related to medial geniculate body and artery cortex. So if you see in Vera, the most prominent wave will be the fifth wave. So most prominent wave on Vera is fifth wave, MCQ, remember. Okay. So if the, uh, this is a normal Vera, apart from your rotoacoustic emissions, Vera is the test that can detect the Congenital, that is used to detect the congenital hearing screening. Okay, that is used to screen the congenital deafness. See, whenever a congenital hearing child, deafness child comes to you, how you are going to detect? Okay, see, pinna you can see visually directly. With otoscope, you can see the external artery canal and tympanic membrane also you can see with an otoscope. So till this level, it is visually with the help of otoscope, you can directly see. How you are going to check the function of the middle ear by impedance audiometry. If you do the impedance audiometry, A type curve is coming means middle ear is normal. And you are doing the autoacoustic emissions and the autoacoustic emissions pass means if they are present, means cochlea is functioning normally. Then I go for a beta and if the beta is normal means the auditory nerve is also functioning normally. So that's it. The patient, the child is hearing normally. Okay. So here the... This one, the, here, uh, one thing, someone asked for subjective and objective. In Puton audiometry, what you are doing? You are giving inputs to the patient and you are asking the patient whether he is hearing this or not. So the results of the test depends on the result, uh, the responses given by the patient, subject. So that is subjective test. Whereas in objective test, you do not ask the patient. You can even sedate the patient, put the electrode, give a sound stimulus and check the electrical impulses, right? Whether the graph is coming normally or not. So there is no... Uh, participation by the object, I mean by, by the subject, okay? So that is objective investigation. For autoacoustic emissions, you put the probe, send the signal, and that mic itself will collect, uh, collect that low intensity sounds, autoacoustic emissions, uh, and that machine itself will say whether it is hearing, the patient is hearing or not. So it is also objective. And impedance audiometry also is an objective test. No need to give for the patient to give any responses. Only in Pluton audiometry, the patient has to give responses. That is a subjective test. So which is true about Vera? So where it can be used for screening of hearing loss. Yeah, just now we have studied. Yes, it is an invasive. No, it is a non-invasive procedure. It is not an invasive procedure. It can be used for assessing. Of course, partially this statement is also true. It is a subject to know it is an objective investigation, right? Okay, which are the objective? Just now we have discussed. So, you know, pure tone audiometry is the subject to test, whereas autoacoustic emissions, impedance audiometry or tympanometry and beta, all these are objective tests. Okay, so this is the right answer. And now coming to the manias disease, what exactly is this manias disease? Increased amounts of endolymph will be there and the patient will be having complaints of vertigo due to that. So what happens? Increased amounts of endolymph will cause unnecessary amounts of pressure on the sensory structures lying inside the membranous labyrinth, your saccule, utricle, uh, the macula which are present inside these structures and the cristae which are present in the semicircular canals are unnecessary getting pressurized and they cause the unnecessary stimulus are being sent that causes vertigo in this case. So huge amounts of endolymph fluid is present inside. So patient will have a feeling of oral fullness and sensory neural hearing loss will be there. That to a fluctuating type, as we already discussed, fluctuating conductive loss is seen in OME, as well as you can also have a roaring type of tinnitus in these cases. Okay. In glomus, it is a pulsatile tinnitus. In menias, it is a roaring tinnitus. So you can remember with the mnemonic vast here. Okay, so vertigo followed by sensory neural hearing loss can be seen in case of manias disease. And the pathogenesis here is higher amounts of endolymph, right? So that's why this condition is also called as endolymphatic high drops. So now this is, you see, the normal one and the manias one. You can see the bluish part completely getting bulged up the membranous. Yeah, it is episodic. The membranous part completely getting bulged up due to increased endolymph. Uh, so in these cases, the investigation of choice will be you know the clinical features. The investigation of choice would be electrocochleography. So electrocochleography, what is the ratio you get here? 
SB by AP ratio should be more than 30%. So that indicates the, yeah. For retrocochlear pathologies, you know, Bera is done. We will come to that, don't worry. And uh, on pure tone audiometry in early stages, in early stages, you will get a upsloping curve. You will get an upsloping curve like this, okay? So upsloping curve that you see in case of your Menias disease. So the treatment options for Menias are, so what are the treatment options? First of all, medical treatment. So what is here? More amount of fluid. What you should do? You should reduce the fluid. So diuretics can be tried as well as you can give beta histines that improve the blood supply, microvascular blood supply to the cochlea, as well as you can also give the symptoms are severe. You can give vestibular sedatives like prochlorparagin to the patient and also carbosin inhalation, all those things you can give. Yes, someone is asking about tulio phenomena. So tulio phenomena, what do you mean by so, tulio phenomena? Vertigo on hearing loud sounds. So whenever the patient is hearing sudden loud sounds, he'll get vertigo. Why? Because whenever a loud sound is heard, immediately stapes will move a little bit more inward. A sudden inward deeper movement of the stapes foot plate. So normally the saccule won't lie that much laterally. But due to the more amount of endolymph inside, the saccule is now bulged and it is lying a little bit laterally. And the stapes foot plate, whenever it is hearing loud sounds, it will touch the saccule and that will stimulate the macula inside that will cause giddiness to the patient. So you remember this one, Tulio phenomena, vertigo on loud sounds. Okay. So we'll come. Okay. I'll try to uh, put it. Okay. So this is about uh, the treatment. We are in the treatment part. And uh, so medical treatment over. If it is still intractable, now you have to go for surgical. There are Hearing preserving surgeries as well as hearing destructive surgeries, okay, where in the surgeries hearing is also lost. So complete labyrinthectomy, you are removing the complete labyrinth. I mean, you are completely plugging the labyrinth and you are removing the fluid from inside. You are damaging the labyrinth by yourself. Then that is labyrinthectomy where hearing is also lost. Labyrinth means inner ear. So hearing is also lost in these uh, destructive procedures. Whereas in case of preserving procedures, endolymphatic sac decompression you will do. So what is this endolymphatic sac decompression? Yes, Silverstein micro can come into that. ELS decompression, what we do is, see the endolymph which is produced from the stria vascularis is circulating in the membranous labyrinth and that it is drained outward through the endolymphatic sac. So at the endolymphatic sac area, if I open the endolymphatic sac area a little bit and put it there, what happens? More amount of fluid will be draining outward. So I will, I myself am creating a drainage pathway for the endolymphatic fluid. So that is what your if, uh, endolymphatic sac decompression procedure is done for. If the, if you have to do this procedure, first you have to identify where this endolymphatic sac is present. So to identify the endolymphatic sac, there is a line called as Donaldson's line. So this Donaldson line helps you in identifying the area of the endolymphatic sac. See, this is your lateral semicircular canal. Okay. And this is your posterior semicircular canal. So in the plane of the lateral semicircular canal, if I draw a line posteriorly that bisects the posterior canal, posterior semicircular canal, and uh, below the line, down below, inferior to that line, I will be able to notice the endolymphatic sac here. Okay. So that line is called as Donaldson's line. Okay. Our simple line, you can remember, Donaldson line is helpful for identifying the endolymphatic sac. Clear? Now, a 35-year-old male presented to the clinic with complaints of episodic vertigo. See, okay, the patient is having vertigo, ear pressure fullness, and decreased hearing, low tone, roaring tinnitus. So, obviously, there is many as in BPPV, there won't be hearing loss. Only giddiness will be there, right? In case, see, BPPV, the otoconia gets dislodged, and the, see, the otoconia are supposed to stay in the utricular and sacu. But they somehow gets dislodged and they enter into the semicircular canal and they will be continuously disturbing this uh, crista here. And labyrinthitis, entire inner ear gets infected. So it's a syncope is a central thing, okay? Not peripheral. Now coming to the acoustic neuroma, the most common site of origin is in, uh, inferior vestibular nerve. It compresses the surrounding nerves at is, as it grows into the cerebellopontine angle. So most common CP angle tumor is your acoustic neuroma. Second most common is, anyone? Second most common? What is second most common? 
What is second most common CP angle tumor? Meningioma, right? So how patient present with BPPV? Only giddiness, positional change, giddiness and positional change. So acoustic neuroma, how the patient presents in acoustic neuroma? Unilateral SNHL with the tinnitus. This is the presentation method in case of acoustic neuroma. Now coming to the acoustic neuroma. So what is the sign that indicates fifth cranial nerve involvement? Decreased corneal sensation indicates fifth cranial nerve involvement. Seventh cranial nerve is involved, which is the first sign that occurs, Hitzelberger sign. What is this Hitzelberger sign? Hypoesthesia of the posterior meatal wall. That is uh, this one. The treatment for the investigation of choice for acoustic neuroma is gadolinium MRI. And uh, on Pewton audiometry, you can see here the right side SNHL, you can see, and the left side, this is normal, right? So that uh, MRI also, on MRI, what you will see, you will see an ice cream cone appearance. You will see an ice cream cone appearance of the tumor in the CP angle area. Now, coming to this uh, HPE finding. So, what is the HPE finding in case of a acoustic neuroma? See, a 23 year old male presenting with hearing loss and tinnitus. Histology is the image. What is this, this histology image do? Uh, Antony A area, which is rich in cells, and Antony B area, which is very uh, rare in uh, cells. Okay. High density, low density areas, alternatively, you can see. So, Antony A, high dense area, Antony B, low dense area. And in Antony A, you can see the Veroke bodies also, you can see here. So, this is a typical of a spanoma. And in case of this, is a case of neurofibroma, you can see multinucleated chain cells, the leomyoma, spindle shaped cells, and rhabdomyoma, myocytes enlarged, you can see. So, these are the various uh, differentiating features between cochlear and retrocochlear lesions. Recruitment and CC score are specific for cochlear lesions, whereas uh, retrocochlear lesions like your acoustic neuroma, SDS will be very poor, rollover phenomena will be seen, tone decay test will be more, and stepidial reflex is absent, and beta will be abnormal. So this you have to remember. Detailed description is given in your regular classes. It is not possible to detail it discuss here. BPPV is the most common cause of vertigo. And what is the main present here? Positional change, vertigo on positional change. And what is the diagnostic test you do here? What is the diagnostic test you do? Diagnostic Dix Hall Pike. Dix Hall Pike is the diagnostic test. And what is the therapeutic test you do here? That is the Eplis maneuver, right? An individual who is experiencing vertigo does not have a hearing impairment, has considered a ENT surgeon. He proceeds with a diagnostic te technique followed by a carefully executed therapeutic procedure. So, diagnostic method is nothing but your Dix Hall Pike, and therapeutic procedure is nothing but Eplis. So, they are asking what is the diagnostic method? That is your Dix Hall Pike, okay? So this is your epi. So what is the sequences of angles you follow in Dix Hall Pike? 45, then 30. In case of epi, 45, 30, 90, and 90, right? So in normal regular classes, we have discussed this in detail and coming to the other topics of here. So Bell's palsy, you all know, it's a element. Bell's palsy is a lower motor neuron type of palsy. And what all symptoms you'll be having? Patient will be unable to close the eye, drooling of saliva, deviation of the angle of the mouth will be there. So here facial nerve will be involved, lower motor neuron type. You can see all these uh, symptoms, absent nasolabial fold. And the patient is presenting with the Bell's palsy. Which of the following part of the face is paralyzed? So same side, upper and lower part will be paralyzed, right? So this is a LMN palsy, not UMN palsy. In UMN palsy, the upper sides will be spared. Now coming to the temporal bone fractures. There are two types of longitudinal fractures and transverse fractures, right? So in case of longitudinal fractures, which is the most structure involved, middle ear is involved more. In case of transverse fracture, inner ear is involved more. So as middle ear is involved, what the patient will be having? Conductive hearing loss. Also, hemotympanum, blood in the middle ear. You see in case of longitudinal fractures. If you see the transverse fractures, here cochlea is involved. So the patient will be having sensory neural hearing loss. Also, the patient will be having complaint of giddiness as well as tinnitus, as well as the risk of facial palsy is more in case of transverse fractures. Hope you got the point how to remember, right? Are you able to follow? So coming to the hearing aids. So there are various types of hearing aids of which behind the ear is the most common type of hearing aid which we use. So hearing aid, what hearing aid will do? It will receive the sounds, it will amplify the sounds, it will send inside the amplified sounds, right? So that's how the how much the amount of hearing loss the patient is having, that much amplification the hearing aid will do and it will send inside. So, okay, this is BTE, behind the ear hearing aid, most commonly used. And this is Baha. This is fitted onto the occipital bone posteriorly. 
and those whoever are having ear canal problems see this is a pinnaplasty done okay pinnaplasty is done you can see the if you observe it clearly this is pinnaplasty done there is external artery canal atresia is there so you cannot fix a B bte EA hearing aid here you cannot put because for a behind the ear hearing aid the receiver should be put in the ear canal your ear canal should be normal the sound should go it through the ear canal into the tympanic membrane like that but here there is canal atresia means you cannot use the behind the ear hearing aid you have to put a baha so what baha will do it will directly vibrate the bone here so all the vibrations are directly transferred through the bone directly transferred into the cochlea and that is how the patient will be able directly cochlea it will uh, the bone vibrations will be directly stimulating the cochlea inner ear so in which of the following conditions is baha used it is used in case of congenital external artery canal atresia of course snhl you can use it's not that you cannot use it in case of chl external artery canal atresia only if there to the patient what does it cause conductive hearing loss in such cases also you can use beta acoustic neuroma you can uh, you can but it is not uh, uh, it's not regularly uh, prescribed for acoustic neuroma the treatment option is surgical excision of the tumor right okay and uh, otitis media is treated surgical right now coming to the cochlear implant you all know through the posterior tympanotomy through the facial recess the electrode is implanted see the speech processor and transfer as soon as the sound waves are received it is converted into electrical signal here and through the electrode the electrical signals are sent into the cochlea and uh, for the cochlear implant auditory nerve should be intact okay so then only all the sound electrical signals that are coming here will be transported through the intact auditory nerve towards the brain okay so this is about cochlear implant if the auditory nerve is not functioning even though you put a cochlear implant it won't be of any use so if there is any auditory neuropathy if there is auditory neuropathy so what you should do you should go for a auditory brain stem implant if the auditory nerve is not functioning then you have to directly put the implant on the brain stem here right okay on the lateral process of your fourth ventricle lateral recess of the fourth ventricle so coming to this mcq a child with bilateral snhl loss was given hearing aids and uh, it is not functioning no, no positive result was uh, received uh, so next treatment option is obviously cochlear implant so whenever an snhl congenital snhl patient comes to you first advise the hearing aid for six months and see whether the child is able to uh, improve or not if the child is not improving then you have to go for a cochlear implantation so that is one of the candidacy criteria for your cochlear implantation and you know whenever there is an auditory neuropathy you have to go for absi see this question a woman presents with impaired hearing audiometry findings are given below right combination so first of all let us interpret this audiometry so what is being shown here both right side and left side are being shown here if you see the red side uh, right <coughs> right ear is uh, uh, denoted with a red color uh, pen and the uh, left side is denoted with a blue color always so keep that keep that in mind r r like that you can remember so right side is denoted with red color so if you see here see both waves are the both air conduction and bone conduction waves are uh, nearby to each other without any gap so the right side is normal here you can see hardly at the level of 15 decibels you are getting this means so it is normal in the middle or lower part of the graph both waves air conduction and both bone conduction waves are present for the left ear and they are not separated by any gap that means left side snhl is present so audiometry interpretation is like this ear this patient is having left snhl am i right are you getting the point are you able to follow no interpretation of this interpretation of this yes fine right only few students are continuously replying it's okay fine okay so now see which one is indicating the left snhl here see rini negative means left rini negative means it is conductive so this is not again here lift left rini negative means it is indicating left conductive so this should not be so left rini positive yes this is indicating and this is indicating now we have to come to the weber which side the patient is having problem left ear so when i do a weber if the weber is lateralizing towards the affected ear what does that mean this is having conductive hearing loss if the weber is lateralizing towards the normal ear what does that mean this side is having the uh, sensory neural hearing loss so weber should be lateralized towards the right ear okay so this is the the third option is the correct answer right clear i hope it is clear so which of the following is a cause of snhl so labyrinthitis inner ear condition snhl yes otosclerosis middle ear no conductive earwax external artery canal so conductive hearing loss 
CSOM middle layer conductive hearing loss, right? In which of the following conditions is the P tympanogram seen? Ossicular dislocation AD type, otosclerosis AS type, serous otitis media B type, normal ear A type, right? So answer is serous otitis media, right? A young lady presented to the OPD with history of sudden onset of your unilateral hearing loss, tinnitus and dizziness following an episode of acute otitis media two weeks back. Rinny was positive. She had refused treatment then and currently came with complaints of worse and hearing loss in the affected ear. That means the hearing loss was, see, Rinny was positive. The patient was having hearing loss and Rinny was positive at that time. What does that indicate? Patient was having SNHL at that time. Now she has come with even worse and hearing loss. So severe unilateral hearing loss. Severe unilateral SNHL is there to this patient. Okay. So in case of severe unilateral SNHL, what Rini you will get? False negative Rini you will get. Why false negative? Anyone? Why false negative Rini you get here? See, what, what you are doing in Rini? In Rini, you are putting the, uh, you are checking for air conduction as well as bone conduction. So, in severe unilateral hearing loss, what happens? When I am putting the tuning fork on the bone, the sounds are transmitting to the opposite side cochlea. Opposite side cochlea is actually hearing. The patient will say that he is able to hear. So, you will think that bone conduction is better than air conduction and you will mark this ear as really negative. But that is not actual negative, that is false negative. Because the actual thing what is happening inside is that opposite cochlea is hearing, not this cochlea is hearing. Opposite cochlea is hearing, but the patient doesn't know. Patient only says that if he is able to hear, he says that he is hearing. If he is not able to hear, he says that he is not hearing. Okay. So, as the transcranial transmission of sound to the other cochlea, will the patient will be able to hear because of that. So, that will be causing the false negative result here. Okay. Now, moving on to the next one. What is battle sign? Repeated, repeated, repeated. Okay. This is very clear. A periorbital hematoma, a bejeweled lapses, you know, and this is perichondritis, right? Now, moving on to the nose. Shall we take a break? So, it's almost 4.30. So, we started at 2.45. So, we have to be even a little bit more fast. Two minutes break. Shall we two minutes break, Leliji? Yes. <clears throat> Are you all there? So iceberg. So you tell me why iceberg is there. You tell me why iceberg is there. You can correlate with the diagram which is present just besides it. No doubts. No doubts now. I am not going to address any doubts now. Whoever are having whatever the doubts you have. You have to personally, you can message me. You can personally, even Instagram, I'm available there. You can personally message or you can directly 
uh, message me to my mobile also. I don't have any issues. So whenever I'm free, I can definitely respond. So that is my mobile number you can have. Right, so we have to move fast. So coming to the nose. So uh, if you take the external nose, so what is that there present? Upper one third, now again, one more one third, two third. Upper one third bony, nasal bones. Lower two third, cartilaginous bones. What are the cartilages present? Upper lateral as well as lower lateral. What is this lower lateral cartilage also called as? Alar cartilage. Okay, what are the parts of your alar cartilage? Medial crura, lateral crura. This also, lateral crura, medial crura. What these two medial crura are doing? Joining together and forming the columnar septum. So which of the following is true regarding the nose, external nose? So what is true? Bone one third and cartilage two third, right? Okay, yes. Now coming to rhinophyma, also called as potato tumor, sebaceous gland hypertrophy at the tip of the nose will cause this potato tumor. Long standing history of acne rosacea will be there. So this is the condition asked previously. It is rhinophyma, not rhinoscleroma is completely different where you can see the uh, uh, Klebsiella rhinoscleromitis infection, atrophic cicatricial and granulomatous stages will be seen. Rhinosporidiosis is a strawberry shaped mass. Rhinosporidium seaberry will be causing that. We'll come to it. And coming to the nasal cavity lateral wall. So if you take the lateral wall, this greenish colored anterior most part, which is lined with the skin and the hair is called as the vestibule. Infections in this area, again, staphylococcal infections in this area, hair follicle infection can cause vestibulitis, okay? So patient will be having severe pain and some, some tenderness will be there. Do anti-staphylococcal antibiotics, both topical and systemic and painkillers, that will be enough. Okay, so this is about vestibule. Anterior skin lined part in the nasal cavity is the vestibule. Okay, and the hair are called as vibrissae. And coming to the lateral nasal wall, you are having three turbinates on each lateral wall. Inferior turbinate, middle turbinate and superior turbinate. Inferior turbinate is a separate piece of bone. Middle turbinate and superior turbinate are parts of ethmoid bone. Right. And coming to the, uh, if you take the lateral nasal wall, okay. So this is inferior turbinate and this is inferior meatus. This is middle turbinate and this is middle meatus. This is superior turbinate and this is superior meatus. Right. So right behind each turbinate, its respective meatus will be present. Now, if you come to inferior turbinate, say this is a normal size of inferior turbinate and this is enlarged inferior turbinate. You see this condition in chronic hypertrophic rhinitis chronic hypertrophic rhinitis as well as allergic rhinitis. Also, you will see this enlarged inferior turbinate that will compromise the airway and patient will be having nose block conditions, right? Nose block complaint will be there. Okay. So now coming to the identify the marker structure in the given endoscopic view. So what is this structure? This is inferior turbinate. And here underlying is the inferior meatus. This is septum. Which side nasal cavity is this? Right side or left side? Right or left? No. This is right side. Patient is sitting in front of you. This is right side. Okay. Whichever side septum is there, that side, no it is. Okay. So now, so this is middle turbinate. If you see here in this area, this is the middle turbinate. If I pass my scope, if I send my scope, pass my scope till this level, I will be able to see middle turbinate. Even still superior in this area, if I go, I'll be able to find the superior turbinate. Right. And this is the ancinate process in the middle meatus area. Okay. So this is your ancinate process here in the middle meatus area. Now coming to the inferior meatus, what is this opening in the inferior meatus? In the inferior meatus, this is inferior turbinates. Okay. Like this inferior turbinate is there. Okay. I am in the, now I am in the inferior meatus. What is the opening in the inferior meatus? Yes. Nasolacrimal duct with the help of Hasner's valve opens into the inferior meatus. And what is this nasolacrimal apparatus? If you take your eye, what happens? The superior puncta, inferior puncta, superior canaliculus, inferior canaliculus, both will join to form common canaliculus and common canaliculus will open into your lacrimal sac. Lacrimal sac will open into nasolacrimal duct. Through Hasner's valve, it will be opening into the inferior meatus, isn't it? So tears whichever are coming, from the lacrimal gland lying posterior superiorly in the orbit. So all the secretions will be coming onto the uh, T, uh, eye su superficial surface and all the tears will be entering through the punctum into the canaliculi and then into the lacrimal sac and then into the nasolacrimal duct, right? Clear? So this is about your nasolacrimal apparatus. 
Lacrimal sac is present on which wall of the orbit? See, this is the, here is your lacrimal sac present. So chronic infections of the lacrimal sac will cause chronic dacryocystitis. What is the surgery you do for this chronic dacryocystitis? DCR, dacryocystorhinostomy, right? And also for NLD obstruction, if this tube is blocked, nasolacrimal duct is blocked, you will open into the nose from here. That is DCR. Okay. If it is congenital nasolacrimal duct obstruction, you can wait till six months of age. First, you should, you should do massaging repeatedly, regularly. So it may get opened up. But if it does not happen, even after six months or one year, you have to go for a surgical thing. <clears throat> okay. Initially massage, if not successful, then surgery. Now coming to the middle turbinate, it has got three parts. The first part is sagittal, second part is uh, uh, your coronal, and the third part is axial. The second coronal part is also called as basal lamella or ground lamella. Yeah, massage only in child, right? Yeah, basal lamella or ground lamella. And this basal lamella or ground lamella separates anterior ethmoids from the posterior ethmoids. So these are three parts of the middle turbinate of which second part separates the anterior and posterior ethmoid layer cells. It is also called as basal lamella or ground lamella. The middle turbinate entire structure appears like a dried leaf. So it may be difficult now to understand everything. If you have already studied, you will now easily understand everything. See, this is the middle turbinate, right? Can you, are you able to see? The middle turbinate and this is the middle meatus. And this margin, you can see this ancillary process margin. And this is the bulla ethmoidalis. In between the bulla and the ancillary process, the door like the two dimensional space present between here is the hiatus. And through this hiatus, if I go behind this ancillary process, I will be landing in a three-dimensional space that I call it as ethmoidal infantibulum. So this ancillary process, bulla ethmoidalis and ethmoidal infantibulum, all together called as osteomedial complex or picardial circle. Okay, right. So into the middle meatus, your anterior ethmoids, maxillary sinus, frontal sinus. These three are supposed to drain into your middle meatus. Okay, remember this point. Now moving on to the concabulosa, pneumatization. What is concabulosa? Pneumatization of the middle turbinate pneumatization. See, this is your middle turbinate, right? So how it is pneumatized, you can see entire air present inside. So pneumatization of the pneumatization of the middle turbinate is concabulosa. And uh, agarnase, what is agarnase? Anterior most ethmoidal air cell anterior most ethmoidal air cell is agar nasai. See, it is lying here in the agar nasai, in the lacrimal bone is present and the frontal drainage is being impeded by this. So, it uh, the presence of this cell may impede the frontal drainage. It may affect the frontal sinus drainage and can cause frontal sinusitis. Okay. Right. Now, what are the air cells located in the anterior most part of the anterior ethmoidal air cells is your agar nasai. So what is bulla ethmoidalis? Bulla ethmoidalis is the largest anterior ethmoidal air cell. Onodi cell, what is onodi cell which is present near to the optic nerve? It's a posterior ethmoid pneumatization above the sphenoid. You can see the sphenoid over here, above it the posterior ethmoid has pneumatized and see how the onodi cell is present near to the optic nerve. And what is this haller cell? It is a infra or orbital floor. The floor of the orbit, uh, in the infra orbital wall you can see the pneumatization. That you call it as. So, Haller cell is floor of the orbit. Near to floor of the orbit. Right? Clear? So, now coming to the middle meatus. As we have already discussed all those things. And most common site of obstruction of a nasal polyp from the maxillary sinus. See, maxillary sinus will be opening into middle meatus. So, obviously, whenever a polyp is coming from the maxillary sinus into the nasal cavity, it will first come into the middle meatus. It won't contact the superior or inferior meatus. Right? So, into the inferior meatus, you know, nasolacrimal duct. Into the superior meatus, what posterior ethmoid will open? Into the sphenoethmoidal recess, your sphenoid sinus will open. Okay. Now, coming to the Haller cell, you all know this is the Haller cell. Okay. And which is present in the floor of the orbit near the infra orbital now. In superior turbinate, it's a part of the ethmoid bone. Your inferior turbinate is a separate piece of bone, but your middle and superior turbinates are parts of your ethmoid bone. And superior turbinate, into the superior meatus, what opens? Superior meatus, which sinus opens into the superior meatus? Which sinus opens into the posterior ethmoid? And which sinus opens into the sphenoethmoidal recess? Which sinus opens into the sphenoethmoidal recess? Yes, sphenoid sinus, right. Now coming to the septum, 
you all know the parts the major parts you have to remember is ethmoid perpendicular plate superiorly cartilage anterior inferiorly quadrangular cartilage and the vomer posterior inferiorly so these three form the main bulk of the septum whereas the other parts nasal bones frontal spine and your maxillary crest palatine crest sphenoid rostrum here okay so all these are also forming structures of your septum uh, uh, adding to the parts of the septum right so main mainly you have to remember perpendicular plate of the ethmoid cartilage anterior inferiorly vomer posterior inferiorly and now coming to the membranous and columellar initially only we have studied that the lower lateral cartilages the medial crura are forming the columellar cartilage and behind the columellar cartilage you have the cartilage deficient area that you call the membranous if you touch the tip of your nasal septum here and the lower border you can now feel the bulge and first initially you can feel the bulge that is columellar and if you just go posteriorly you can feel the deficit area cartilage deficit area that is membranous septum and if you still go posteriorly you can touch the hard substance that is your septal cartilage okay now coming to the septal trauma if it is jarge away means blow from the front will cause a jarge away type of fracture and the blow from below will cause a chevalet type of fracture and blow from the side will cause a c shaped fracture and sometimes if the fracture is well enough and ruptured the blood vessels a hematoma can get blood can get collected and it can form a hematoma and uh, see if uh, there is a nasal bone displaced fracture displaced nasal bone fracture is there you may have to go for a reduction see closer reduction is done most of the times so that is done with the help of forceps that you call it as walsham forceps as well as so you may have to do a septal reduction also along with that sometimes that you do with the help of ash forceps okay septal reduction walsham is for nasal bone reduction usually you do this three to five days after the fracture after the trauma not immediately why why because edema will be there initially and when edema is there do not attempt any surgical technique there okay right now coming to the a young adult presents with a deformed nose after formal falling from a ladder ct shows a displaced nasal fracture ideal time to reduce the fracture in this case you all know it is five to seven days uh, within 12 hours edema will be there you need not reduce it cannot reduce it after two weeks or four weeks there may be callus formation that may Inter so you, it, you may find it difficult to reduce the fracture at that point of time. Now coming to the septal deviations, high arched palate in cases of a constant persistent adenoid hypertrophy cases can be seen. Anterior dislocation, C-shaped, S-shaped, spur type and uh, thickening can be seen. Why thickening occurs? The uh, untreated septal abscess or septal uh, hematoma can sometimes get fibrosed and forms a thick and nasal septum. And uh, cortical test is detected to, is done to detect the deviated septum, also to detect the nasal wall opatency. So on pulling the cheek towards the affected side, the patient will feel a better breath uh, through that side. So that is your cortical test. So this question was asked once. So this is cortical test, which is shown in the picture. And this picture shows the Eplis maneuver. And this picture shows the Hemlich maneuver that is done for foreign bodies in adults. And uh, the uh, trotter's method is done for epistaxis. Okay, pinch the nose and bend forward. That is your trotter's method. And coming to the SMR or septoplasty, for what these surgeries are done? Deviated nasal septum, you can do SMR and septoplasty surgeries. And now coming to the septal hematoma. What is septal hematoma? Immediately after trauma, on either side, you will be having a, a both soft and fluctuant tumors. You can fluctuant masses, you can see on either side of the septum due to collection of the blood completely on either side of the septum. And if you have to go for incision and drainage immediately, just like your pinna hematoma, where you need to go for IND immediately to uh, avoid the pinna deformity, cauliflower ear. Here also septal hematoma, you have to immediately drain and relieve the pressure inside to prevent the necrosis of the cartilaginous or the bony septum and thereby preventing the further complications. Okay, so systemic antibiotics can be given later on after the incision and drainage. HRCT is a must, but next best step will always be incision and drainage to reduce the complications. SMR is done for DNS surgery, not for hematoma. And now coming to the septal abscess, if septal hematoma is not treated properly and any secondary bacterial infection comes in and it sets in, then there may be a pus formation in that area and that can lead to septal abscess. So patient will also be having fever and increased pain symptoms will be there. So you have to drain it. Incision and drainage is again the important uh, uh, the thing you have to do there. Septal perforation, 
if there is any cocaine usage patient syphilis uh, vaginal granulomatosis sarcoidosis tuberculosis all granulomatous disorders uh, in the, there what the septal uh, both set, the complete septal destruction may happen and both nasal cavities will be communicating to each other with the help of a perforation so that is your septal perforation through and through defect of the nasal septum both nasal cavities will be perfor communicating with each other so it may be small or it may be large if it is small whistling will be the main complaint if it is large if it is large, crusting will be the main complaint. So treatment will be with the help of septal buttons, septal buttons or mucosal advancement, mucosal advancement flap technique. Okay, mucosal advancement flap technique can be used. So remember one point, bony septal perforation is seen in case of syphilis. This is leprosy, anterior cartilaginous septal perforations. Rhinosporidiosis, you don't see any perforations in this case. Tuberculosis also, you can see anterior cartilaginous perforations, but not posterior bony perforations. Syphilis is the one that is concerned with here. The gummatous lesions that form will are able to even erode the bones. So syphilis is dangerous, right? Now, coming to the epistaxis, and in case of uh, blood supply to the septum, you know what are the arteries, various arteries that supply to the septum? Anterior ethmoidal artery, posterior ethmoidal artery, you know, your sphenopalatine artery, greater palatine artery, and superior labial branch of the facial artery. Anterior and posterior ethmoidal are branches of ophthalmic artery, which is a branch of internal carotid artery. Sphenopalatine and greater palatine are branches of maxillary artery. And facial and this maxillary, uh, both these are branches of external carotid artery. And both these are branches of common carotid artery. Am I right? Okay, so this is a blood supply. So little area is the anterior inferior part of your septum, most common site of epistaxis and most common reason in children uh, is the no speaking habit. Okay, and what are the four arteries that comprise? See the anterior ethmoidal artery, sphenopalatine artery, greater palatine artery and superior labial branch of the facial artery. Except your posterior ethmoidal artery, all the other four are supplying this area. They are forming a thick plexus in the anterior inferior part of the septum. That is little area, which is most common site of epistaxis. See, which of the following statements is true with respect to the little area? Key cell backs plexus is obviously present in the little area. It is situated in the antero inferior part of the septum. It is the most common site for epistaxis. Anastomosis of four major arteries occur here, not seven, right? So, which of these options is not a division originating from the external carotid artery within key cell backs plexus? Okay. So, from the C, you, need, you, you know, anterior and posterior ethmoidal are branches of are the branches of internal carotid artery, not the external carotid artery, right? Sphenopalatine artery and uh, your uh, uh, septal branch of superior labial, that's facial. Both these are maxillary branches and uh, this uh, greater palatine is also, uh, this is also a branch of maxillary. This is facial. Facial and maxillary are branches of the external carotid artery. Okay. So this is your answer, right? Okay. Now moving on to the epistaxis treatment. So the first, whenever a patient comes to you with epistaxis, try first of all, try all conservative methods. Try to stop the bleed with all your conservative methods, tranexamic acid, and uh, try put installing the local otterbin drops you can give. And uh, if you are able to identify a particular point bleeder, you can try to cauterize that also. But if you are unable, then you have to go for packing methods. So first anterior nasal packing followed by posterior nasal packing. And if still that uh, epistaxis is continuing, then you have to go for ligation techniques. The first artery that you ligate is the sphenopalatine artery. Why you are, uh, because a majority of the blood supply to the septum is from the sphenopalatine artery. The sphenopalatine artery is also called as artery of epistaxis. So that's why first you do a sphenopalatine artery ligation. You call this process as tespal, right? And... Uh, if the sphenopalatine artery ligation doesn't help, then you go its parent branch. Maxillary artery is the second one to get ligated. If it also uh, fails, then you have to ligate the external carotid artery. The third one you go on ligating. And then you go and ligating the anterior ethmoidal artery. That is the fourth one to ligate. So mostly by this time, the bleeding will definitely stop. Okay. So a patient presents to the emergency with epistaxis, no relief on pinching the nostrils. Pinching the nostrils means Schroeder's method, no relief. Nasal packing was done, but still bleeding. Now, next method is ligation. First one to get ligated is ligation of sphenopalatine arsenic. Which of the following tests cannot be used to assess nasal mucociliary clearance? Electron microscopy, you can only see the structure of the nasal mucosa, not the function, right? 
see saccharin or charcoal powder or any dye, scintigraph, any dye. If I put on the anterior part of the nose and I collect after a sample, I collect a sample from the posterior part of the nose a little time later, I can see whether this anteriorly placed substance has got migrated to the posterior part or not. So the nasal mucociliary clearance mechanism is working or not, that I can understand with the help of saccharin dye or charcoal powder or any other dye method, scintigraphy. But electron microscopy, you can only observe the structure of the cells, right? Which test is not used? Smell discates are used, Upstate University of Pennsylvania smell identification test, CC's test, all these will be done to identify the smell sense of the patient, but not Arnold stick test. And coming to the inflammatory conditions of the nose, atrophic rhinitis, very important atrophic rhinitis. See what happens here, nerve elements atrophy will be there. So olfactory nerves will be damaged. So the patient will be having anosmia and the blood supply will be reduced due to obliterative endarthritis of the nasal blood vessels. So that will cause, yeah. Arnastic test, I'll let him know, okay. Ammonia can also be used. So blood supply is reduced here. Sorry. So blood supply is reduced here. So what happens? Turbinates will get resolved completely decreased in size. So how you will see this as? See, turbinates will be like this, okay? So very wide, roomy nasal cavities will be there. So due to this wide roominess of the nasal cavities, patient cannot sense the flow of the air. So she will be feeling that she is not able to breathe the air. So she will come to you with complaint of nose block. But on examination, you can see widely open roomy nasal cavities. Okay. And also you can also see the crusting because here what happens? Normally the nasal mucosa is lined with a ciliated epithelium. That ciliated epithelium is lost here. That is changed into a squamous epithelium. All the dirt that is coming out from all the ages that are coming out will get accumulated over there and they will form crusting over there. So crusting is seen in case of atrophic rhinitis. Heavy crusting will be seen. Due to bacterial infection, foul smelling discharge will be seen. So even though foul smelling discharge is occurring from her own nose, the patient is unable to identify because of her anosmia. The patient is unable to uh, identify. So that is called as merciful anosmia. The causative organism here is Klebsiella ozene. Okay. So Klebsiella ozene, merciful anosmia. Okay. Merciful anosmia is present. So here what happens is vitamin A, D, iron deficiencies, racial factors, yellow is uh, and uh, always your uh, uh, estrogen deficiency, hormonal imbalances, all those are known to cause this atrophic rhinitis condition, most common in young females, okay? So here what you have to do in atrophic rhinitis, what you have to do, you have to go for uh, first medical treatment, what you will do, you will give 1 is to 1 is to 2 ratio of sodium uh, bicarbonate, sodium biborate and the sodium chloride in a 280 ml of water, you mix that uh, constituents and you will try to irrigate the nasal mucosa to remove all the crust everything also to inhibit the growth of the organisms you can put you can paint the inside nose with 25 percent glucose in glycerin and also yeah nasal douching is very important and you can give the estradiol spray also you can give estrogen it contains estrogen which increases the uh, blood supply increases the vascularity you can also give uh, chemisetin anti ozena solution where the chemisetin that will be complaining uh, containing chloromycetin vitamin d2 estradiol so those three, you can, uh, so the patient can do nasal douching with that solution also. Uh, if medical treatment is not functioning, then surgical treatment is required that you call it as Young's operation or modified Young's operation or Lotten-Slager's operation. See, a housewife presents with complaints uh, of a blocked nose, loss of smell, dry, greenish, crusty, nasal discharge, nasal cavities appear roomy and the turbinates atrophied. So all these points are to atrophic rhinitis. The submucous resection is done for deviated nasal septum. Young's operation is done for this. Septoplasty is again for DNS. Vidian neurectomy is done for vasomotor rhinitis. So the answer is Young's operation, right? Surgery where one nostril is partially or completely occluded. Partially occluded is modified Young and completely occluded is Young's operation. So this is done for <coughs> this one. Vasomotor rhinitis, you do a Vidian neurectomy. Invasive aspergillosis, you do FS. Allergic rhinitis, no surgical, only conservative. A female patient presents with nasal obstruction, nasal discharge, loss of smell, false smelling discharge, yellowish green crust, again, merciful anosmia. So again, the case is atrophic rhinitis. 
which of the following finding can also be seen? Definitely nasal, roomy nasal cavity will be seen, right? So the, the diagnosis is very clear. Say so this is nasal polyp, you can see completely polyp filling here. Inferior turbinate hypertrophy, you know very well. And uh, coming to allergic rhinitis, this is an IgE mediated type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. And whenever uh, the allergen comes and contacts with the antigens, uh, uh, the antibody, the antibody sitting on the mast cell uh, starts the degranulation of the mast cell. And the degranulation of the mast cell will produce all these preformed mediators as well as newly the prostaglandins, leukotrienes, all those will get released and they will be causing symptoms like immediate patient will be having sneezing, itching and uh, watering. These will be the symptoms present here and these kind of symptoms are also seen in case of vasomotor rhinitis where a uh, uh, sympathetic uh, autonomic imbalance is seen in vasomotor rhinitis. Symptoms will be seen. If you do our investigation, Ig levels will be elevated. Absolute eosinophil counts will be elevated. The treatment will be conservative. You have to give antihistaminics. Uh, also, you can give glucotriene receptor antagonists. You can see mast cell stabilizers. So, okay. So, watery nasal discharge in BMR also you can see. So, this is what you do in case of allergic rhinitis. Coming to vasomotor rhinitis, all the symptoms will be almost similar. Continuous nasal discharge will be there like in allergic rhinitis. But IgE will be normal. AEC will be normal. On investigation, this you will find is normal. Then you can say this could be a vasomotor rhinitis. Here, a video neurectomy surgery will be helpful to the patient. Okay. Now, coming to the a gentleman presents to the OPD with saddle nose deformity, past history of cough, on a fever, hemoptysis, septal perforation, pale granuloma, multiple cavity lesions in chest x ray, biopsy showed granuloma, multinucleated chain cells, caseous necrosis. So many clues in one single question. What is the answer? So many clues. Okay, so many clues are given. Oh, you no know, Westerners. Do you see a caseous necrosis there? Do you see a multinucleated gene cells there? No, tuberculosis, no. The X-ray showing multiple cavity lesions, septal perforation, pale granuloma. It's very clearly hemoptysis. Most common cause of hemoptysis, tuberculosis, right? Okay. Infectious conditions of nose, rhinoscleroma, you know. Klebsiella rhinosclerometis, three stages you have got. First stage is atrophic. This is similar to atrophic rhinitis. Second stage, what is second stage? Granulomatous stage, what happens? Pale granules will start forming there. And third one is cicatricial stage. Here, the granules formed will become bigger and they will uh, occupy the nasal cavity. The nasal cavity will become narrow. So, stenosed nasal cavity will be there, right? So, these are the three stages you see. In rhinoscleroma, even on HPE, if you see, on HP, what uh, peculiarities you see? Mikulic cells and Russell bodies, right? Mikulic cells, Russell bodies. Are you following? Mikulic cells, Russell bodies, the treatment will be streptomycin, okay? Streptomycin, as well as your rifampicin can be given, tetracycline can be given. Am I right? Clear? Okay, if yeah, the nose is uh, stenosed a lot and patient is unable to breathe, you have to do, you have to go surgically. All the nodules you have to excise surgically. Now coming to rhinosporidiosis, rhinosporidium seaberry. Rhinosporidium seaberry is the causative organism. And uh, so what are the three stages? Trophocyte stage, sporangium stage and endospore stage. So endospore stage is the infective stage. In which people you do, uh, you see this very commonly. Those who bath in the Ponds where cattle, the cattle also will be bathing there. Okay. So there uh, you will see these infections very commonly. So a strawberry like uh, mass from the uh, nostril, strawberry like mass, which uh, peculiar feature is it bleeds on touch, right? It bleeds on touch. Yeah, Tamil Nadu, the coastal areas you see it more. So ble bleeds on touch, and the treatment is surgical excision. Surgical excision with the base cauterization. Even some uh, suggested dapsone also as the treatment. Okay. So this is about rhinosporidiosis and coming to other conditions. Inverted papilloma. Why it is called as inverted papilloma? Because the growth of the tumor occurs into the stroma, not outside of the stroma. See, whenever a tumor is growing, it will grow outwards. So in the new cells will be seen outwards. But here, the growth will be occurring inverted into the stroma. New cells will be seen inside, older cells will be seen outside. So that's why it is inverted papilloma, most common in males and females. Elderly males, it will be present and it is locally invasive. Locally invasive. It is not a malignant, it is a benign 
the most common site what is the most common site you see most common site is middle meatus lateral nasal wall right most of the times it is unilateral and patient can uh, present with epistaxis as well as nose block lead block okay fine so hp also shows all the stroma growth occurring inward into the into the stro stroma inward into the stroma okay so this is inverted papilloma what is the treatment of choice for this is medial maxillectomy complete medial wall of the maxilla complete lateral wall of the nose needs to be removed so medial maxillectomy is the surgery of choice a patient presents with complaints of unilateral nasal obstruction and bleeding diagnosis of inverted papilloma true statement it is malignant no it is benign it is locally invasive it is benign it is invasive it is benign it is locally so this is the correct option. sorry this is the correct option. Right. so now coming to paranasal sinuses you know already we all have discussed very clearly maxillary also called as anthropop fimor first sinus to develop most common sinus to get infected present at birth so here you can see on this x-ray what is the sinus Okay, this is the maxillary sinus and these are the orbits and here you can see frontal sinus also. Okay, clear? Nasal septum, right? And now coming to the ethmoid sinuses, you know two groups of ethmoid sinuses, anterior ethmoidal, posterior ethmoidal, separated by second part of middle turbinate or basal lamella, ground lamella, anterior ethmoid and uh, you know most commonly involved in allergic sinusitis or allergic polyposis most commonly happens in ethmoids, most commonly seen in children and coming to frontal, this is also mucosils, pyosils are most commonly seen in case of frontal sinuses, right? And most anterior most sinus, sphenoid is the least commonly affected sinus. So what is the site of drainage of the marker structure? See the greenish marker structure, this is the sphenoid sinus. Sphenoid sinus, you know, it drains into the sphenoid model recess, into the superior meatus, posterior ethmoid drains, into the middle meatus, maxillary, frontal and anterior ethmoidal, into the inferior meatus, nasolacrimal duct opens, right? What is occipital mental view also known as water's view. So this is your occipital, this is occipital frontal showing the frontal sinuses, uh, Cal Calville's view. This is water's view, nose chin position, maxillary view, uh, sinus is best seen here, water's view. And uh, this is submental vertical basal, where sphenoid sinus is very clearly seen. And this is recess view, lateral orbital view we call it. Uh, uh, this is very clearly uh, lateral oblique view where you can see ethmoid sinus as well as orbits very clearly here. Okay. Now, the radiograph presented below to take it to enhance the evaluation of frontal sinus. So, frontal sinus is most commonly seen in Caldwell's view. Water's view is for maxillary sinus. Peary view is for sphenoid sinus. Town's view is for skull fractures. Okay. Right. What is this view called in which frontal sinus is best seen? Again, Caldwell's view. So, coming to sinusitis, you all know what is conca bullosa, what is Paradoxical means your middle turbinate should be present like this. If it gets curved like this, that is paradoxical middle turbinate. Okay, it uh, it blocks the middle uh, maxillary sinus drainage sometimes. And this is deviated nasal septum, hilar cell in the infraorbital floor. Peary and maxillary are not same. Maxillary with open mouth is peary where sphenoid sinus can be seen. Waters with open mouth with waters is the peary view where you can see sphenoid sinus clearly. You can see the unseen getting pneumatized apart from Conca bullosa also you can see here. A patient comes with a history of asthma and sinusitis. You notice this has been attributed to Samter's triad. So asthma, nasal polyposis and aspirin sensitivity. So here aspirin should not be advised to the patient. A 35 year old took female uh, took aspirin for headache. She developed wheezing and breathlessness. She will be associated with. So aspirin, okay. And uh, immediately aspirin sensitivity is there. So possibly Samter's triad possibility. So, nasal polyposis is there. It's not extrinsic asthma is associated. It's intrinsic asthma is associated here. Okay. Remember that point. Now, fungal sinusitis. What's the typical feature you find in CT scans of fungal sinusitis? This hyperdensity is apart from the regular soft tissue that you see in all cases of sinusitis. You can see the whitish hyperdensities. You can see that indicates the fungal sinusitis. Most common organism here is Aspergillus fumigatus. Whereas your most common uh, otomycosis is Aspergillus niger. Are you all following? Clear? So, Aspergillus fumigatus, okay, most common organism. Which of the following are in fungal infections most commonly seen in the maxillary sinus? That is Aspergillosis. You can see, like a, in the maxillary sinus, you can see it sitting as a fungal ball. This we also call it as mycetoma. 
a fungal ball sitting in the micellar sinus. We call it as a mycetoma. Okay. A post-COVID patient who is a non-diabetic develops unilateral facial pain and loosening of teeth. Okay. So a post-COVID diabetic. So here is the patient is immunocompromised. So in immunocompromised, so the, there is a loosening of teeth is also there. So facial pain and the loosening of teeth means maxilla bone is entirely getting involved, infiltrated. So alveoli are getting loosened. The teeth are getting loosened from the alveolar sockets. So that's why uh, that happens in case of, does, this does not happen in case of aspergillosis. This happens in case of uh, mucormycosis, black fungus, right? So mucormycosis, but what is he is asking here? Which investigation you would do for confirmation? Don't rush and put the MRI. Confirmation is always with the help of biopsy, histopathologic examination. MRI is done immediately, of course, to know the extent and see the amount of damage that has occurred. On a HP, you can see aseptate 90 degree branching hyphae. That is typical of mucormycosis. An elderly diabetic treated with steroids for COVID presented with black, false smelling discharge, blackish necrotic mass eroding the septum. So you know all this. That is mucormycosis. And uh, see, this is uh, uh, rhinosporidiosis, right? You all know that. Now coming to FES. Okay, gold standard investigation before FES is, yes, CT scan. So MRI will show you soft tissue more. But here, in case of FES, you need to know the bony margins more importantly. So to delineate the bony margins more better, CT scan is most important. See, you can see the difference between CT scan and MRI. See, in CT scan, how the, it's very clearly, the bony margins are clearly demarcated. But in MRI, there is no proper demarcation. And also in X-ray, X-ray will just tell you whether the sinus is infected or not. It does not show you the extent of the infection. It does not show you any other anatomical malformations like concobulosa, hyalur cell, onodi cell, or your agarnasai, how is bulla, uh, how is the ancinate attachments, everything, okay? How the pneumatization pattern is present, all those anatomical malformations can be clearly seen in case of CT scan only, not with an X. Okay, anteral lavage is a therapeutic procedure to wash the maxillary sinus, remove the contents of the maxillary sinus. Now, coming to the complications of the sinusitis, uh, of, the, of the sinus surgery, FES, sir. So, what are the complications of FES? So, what you are operating in the nose, what is the immediate and uh, besides lying structure, that is your orbit. So, orbital complications will be more. Orbital cellulitis, orbital abscess. Okay, so antibiotics, giving a, a course of antibiotics will be enough in these cases. And sometimes, apart from this, you can also have mucosyl, pyosyl formations inside. Apart from that, you can also have superior orbital fissure syndrome or orbital apex syndrome. Superior orbital fissure syndrome or orbital apex syndrome. Difference between them is optic nerve is involved here. Optic nerve is not involved here. Visual disturbances are present here, here not present. Remember this one. All other, all other symptoms will be same. Ophthalmoplegia, right? So all those will be present. Now, a 35-year-old female patient presents with complaints of nasal obstruction, post-nasal drip. Past history of face for failed conservative management. Unsnectomy, maxillary osteum dilation was done. A DNA now shows patent ostea. That means patent ostea means opening of the sinuses are clear. Mucosal edema is there. Just the swelling of the mucosal lining is there. So this for this, a steroid irrigation will be sufficient. Okay. Because if the ostea are blocked, then you have to repeat the surgery. If the ostea are open, then no need for repeat surgery. Now, coming to nasal polyposis, anthrocoinal as well as ethmoidal, anthrocoinal morally infective type, ethmoidal mostly allergic type, right? So, anthrocoinal mostly adults, ethmoidal mostly children, right? So, now coming to what is this dot sign, which you will differentiate, whether to know the origin of the tumor, the mass in the nasal cavity, whether it is polyp, whether it is JNA, whether it is NPC, the patient will present to you with a nose block and a mass in the nose. So, how you are going to differentiate? On a sagittal view, CT scan, you can see whether the uh, it is a polyp or a JNA or NPC. How? With the help of this dot sign or crescent sign. If it is a polyp, the polyp growth starts from here and it extends posteriorly. From anterior posterior will go. So what happens here? There is a gap left over in between the mass and the posterior pharyngeal wall. So if the gap is present, then dot sign is present. So dot sign is present means that is a tumor arising from the nasal cavity, mass arising from the nasal cavity. So that should be nasal polyp. If the mass is arising from the posterior pharyngeal wall, like your NPC or your JNA, if it is arising from the posterior wall itself, there won't be any gap between the posterior wall and the tumor arising from it. So no gap means dot sign absent, crescent sign absent. So that means the tumor is arising from the JNA, uh, from the posterior pharyngeal wall, 
it could be npc it could be change so that's how you differentiate with the help of dot site so malignancy of sinuses most common site is maxillary nickel exposure is squamous cell carcinoma hardwood dust exposure adenocarcinoma so complaints will be nasal mass epistaxis cheek swelling okay so all this will be there so treatment will be total maxillectomy weber percussion incision is taken for that so on grid lines on grid line give you a uh, prognostic uh, if you pass a line from the medial carthus to the angle of the mandible the tumors lying above will be having bad prognosis as they are lying near to the complex structures like orbit and brain the below that uh, no vital structures are present so they will be having a good prognosis now coming to the trauma phase a lifford structure type 1 transverse pyramidal and craniofacial disjection you know mandible fractures most common uh, mandible area to get fractured is condyle okay of course there is a few textbooks say angle of the mandible but condyle because of its slender anatomy and easily get the prone to get displaced it is the most common one to get fractured condyle fractures second one is the angle zygoma fracture also called as tripod fracture okay also called as tripod fracture also called as blowout fracture or also called as tear drop sign you can see in case of blowout fractures intra orbital floor fracture what happens orbital contents will uh, drop down into the maxillary cavity they will be appearing like a tear drop okay tear drop sign is in here blowout fractures so this is a uh, the same picture given this blowout fracture leaf what you know fracture maxilla and fracture zygomatic right now coming to the csf rhinorrhea idiopathic or trauma rta cases is a cause so what is the clinical feature one sided unilateral watery discharge drop by drop increasing on bending down so what do you see reservoir side what happens here reservoir your paranasal sinuses will act as a reservoir the csf leaking from above will get collected in the sinuses when you bend forward the drops will come outward as drop by drop so that is called a reservoir side and double ring sign or target sign or halo sign when you put in case of traumatic csf rhinorrhea you put a drop of csf on the paper so centrally there will be a red color surrounded by a yellow color halo so that you call it as a double ring sign or target sign or halo sign seen only in case of traumatic csf rhinorrhea handkerchief test if you put the csf on the handkerchief handkerchief won't get stiffened if you put a nasal mucus on the handkerchief it will it will get stiffened beta 2 transferrins specifically present in csf uh, on laboratory testing you can know whether they are present or not high glucose levels usually seen in csf localizing test you give a dye in the do a lumbar puncture put a dye and you can localize the where the dye is leaking in the nasa from above there you can see the localizing of the localization of the uh, defect area of the csf rhinorrhea so treatment will be bed rest elevating the head stool softness because if you strain more intracranial pressure increases and amount of leak increases so nose blowing sneezing straining should be avoided of course if conservatively all these methods are not successful then surgical repair with the fat plugging you can do uh, with that right see this is what is this sign target sign or halo sign or okay double ring sign right so handkerchief sign you all know squad sign is seen in otosclerosis phelps sign is seen in glomus tumor absence of jugulo carotid crust okay spine so congenital conditions of the nose coenal atresia you know it is a persistence of the bucco nasal membrane you see the coena this is unilateral this is bilateral right so coenal atresia there is a block uh, where posterior coena is connecting to the uh, nasopharynx so what happens here the patient will be in case of bilateral cases patient will be difficulty having breathing so in these cases what you have to do mega you can initially insert a mega one nipple that will help in both uh, breathing as well as feeding and uh, later on surgical with mcgowan's technique you can remove the this uh, obstruction and then you can provide the pathway yeah so this is coenal atresia meningoencephalocele so what is this meningoencephalocele so there is a defect if there is a defect in the uh, roof of the this one uh, nasal cavity so sometimes the meninges be along with the cerebral tissue can come and hang in this here so all the cerebral tissue from above will be hanging inside like this uh. so whenever the patient when the child cries what happens increased intracranial pressure will get transmitted and the size of the tumor will increase uh, whenever the patient cries so size increases uh, whenever the, this is sign is called as furstenberg test also as the meninges are the continuation the transillumination will be there here in case of meningocele or meningoencephalocele okay so first and back test will be positive but in cases of glioma what happens even though there is a defect what happens 
the mass has got separated. There is no continuity in between the cerebral mass lying over here and the actual cerebrum lying over above. So no continuity here. So first and bug test will be negative. It does not increase in size when the child cries. Okay. So no transillumination will be seen. For either uh, conditions, surgical excision is the treatment of choice. And coming to the next part, that is larynx. Coming to the larynx, framework of larynx. Okay, first of all, we'll discuss the framework of the larynx. So quickly, you know, this is the hyoid bone and you have uh, of the laryngeal cartilages, how many cartilages are there in total? Nine cartilages, three paired and uh, three unpaired, right? Three paired and three unpaired. So what are these three paired and uh, three unpaired? So, you know, this is thyroid cartilage is unpaired, tricoid cartilage is unpaired, epiglottis is unpaid, three unpaired. And what are the three paired? Arytenoids, corniculate, cuneiform. So these three are paired. So total nine cartilages are there. If you take the thyroid cartilage, it is the largest cartilage. It is having two alley on either side. It is having two alley on the side, superior corno, inferior corno on either side. Superior corno, inferior corno. It does not form a complete ring, right? And if you take the cricoid cartilage, this is the only cartilage that forms a complete ring. If you see from a front, it is appearing as a single, say a thin arch-like structure. On the posterior side, it is very wide and broad. That is, we call it as cricoid lamina. So if you take from the side view, so this is the thyroid and cricoid will be, as you go posteriorly, cricoid will be gradually enlarging. This is anterior, this is posterior, right? And uh, on the cricoid posteriorly will be sitting your arytenoid. From the vocal process of the arytenoid, vocal cord will be attaching to the thyroid. So corniculate, cuneiform, and epiglottis will be arising from here like this, right? So this is how your thyroid, your laryngeal anatomy is present, right? So you are getting this now? Your bullet train only. Definitely bullet train, no other option, right? So coming to the ossification. So coming after the cartilages, coming to the ossification. So for you to simply remember thyroid cartilage, I have already told in the regular classes, cricoid cartilage, arytenoid, Corniculate cuneiform and epiglottis, right? Draw a line such that it separates upper three from lower three. So upper three are elastic, lower three are hyaline. Elastic do not ossify, hyaline ossifies. Clear? Okay. So simple. What are the cartilages that get ossified? Arytenoid, thyroid and cricoid. Now see, these are the three elastic. They do not ossify. Thyroid, cricoid, and arytenoid are hyaline. They get ossified, right? Now, which of the following cartilages is least likely to be calcified? Okay. What is that? Which of the following is least? Now, you can remember now with the help of that uh, diagram, you can easily remember, right? So, epiglottis, corniculate, and cuneiform. Uh, all these three are elastic cartilages. They do not ossify, right? So, they do not calcify a lot. So now coming to the aryepiglottic fold, you all know here is your epiglottis, right? Right, And you all know here was your, so this is your cricoid, right? On over it, you are having your arytenoid corniculate cuneiform like this. So a mucosal fold is completely covering arytenoids and the epiglottis, right? So that's why it is called as aryepiglottic fold. It is enclosing a complete lumen. So this lumen is nothing but your airway, supraglottic airway. Hope you all getting it. Okay. So this is aryepiglottic fold and the lower border of the aryepiglottic fold inside. Okay. If you take the lower border, see the aryepiglottic fold. See, this is the epiglottis lying under this mucosal layer. Okay. And uh, the arytenoids here. Okay. Arytenoids here are present. Right. See the mucosal fold, which is completely covering the arytenoids posteriorly and epiglottis anteriorly on either side completely. It is enclosing a lumen in it as well. This is your aryepiglottic fold uh, and the lumen is the uh, lumen is the supraglottic airway. If you take the lower border of this aryepiglottic fold, the lower border is thickened uh, to form a cord that is called as false vocal cord. Okay. So false vocal cord is formed by lower border of the aryepiglottic fold. If you take uh, the aryepiglottic fold, the lower border, the false vocal cord as well as the true vocal cord, in between them there is an entrance that you call it as vestibule of the larynx. Okay, that leads into the saccule of the larynx. Saccule is also called as oil can of larynx. Why it is called as oil can of larynx? 
is rich in secretions, rich in glands, secretory glands, rich in secretions. Okay. So what happens in cases such as your uh, trumpet blowers, okay, who uh, wind the music instruments, who blow the wind music instruments, they hold the air above the glottis, above the vocal cords, and they will be clear, they will be holding like this, and they will be pressurizing inside the air, their uh, airway, right? So what happens? Through this saccule, whatever the pressure they are putting, what happens? The air is pressurizing on all the walls here, right? So the air is completely pressurizing. So what happens? Slowly, slowly, this sac gets dilated like this and slowly it gets dilated like this and slowly it starts coming outward like this, okay? So it comes like this. So this you call it as this air-filled cystic dilatation of the saccule. Air-filled cystic dilatation. Everything is there in the, the words dilatation of saccule, okay? So that is laryngocele. Okay, so it, uh, it may have an internal, external as well as mixed, right? So now, once so, so it, the uh, external swelling will come to light just lateral to the midline. If you press the swelling, the air will get leaked into the larynx and that will produce a hissing sound. So that sign is called as Bryce sign. So Bryce sign is seen in laryngocele, clear? Okay. So you can see here also, you can see the array epiglottic fold completely bulging inward, right? Okay, whereas this side, it is completely normal. See the air filled, completely air filled cystic gallery, internal component, external component. Internal component, external component, right? Okay. A young male who is a professional trumpet blower with a swelling on the left side, sound when compressing the swelling, see it in, uh, shown below. See, you can see air filled. So obviously it is a laryngocele, very clearly, right? So this is a pharyngeal pouch, if you can see. You can see a pharyngeal barium swallow is done. How the barium is filling in the this posterior pouch to the esophagus, right? So that is pharyngeal pouch. This is tracheoesophageal fistula, right? You can see the connection between the trachea and the esophagus here, tracheoesophageal fistula. Treatment is, uh, for laryngocele, treatment is surgical excision, right? And now coming to the muscles, what is the only abductor? Posterior cricoarotenoid is the only abductor. Am I right? Okay. This is also called as the safety muscle of the larynx. Clear? What are the adductors? Lateral cricoarotenoid, thyroarotenoid, interarotenoid. What is the main tensor? Cricothyroid is the main tensor. Okay. So now coming to posterior cricoarotenoid, see it is abducting. It is abducting. So it is the only abductor of the larynx. And it is a safety muscle of the larynx. What is the safety muscle of the tongue? What is the safety muscle of the tongue? Anyone? What is the safety muscle of the tongue? Genioglossus. Very good. Yeah. We have discussed it in the regular class. And uh, lateral cricoarotenoid is the adductor, main adductor. See, it is adducting the vocal cords medially. So it is adductor. Apart from your interarotenoid also. Here interarotenoid will be like transverse part. That also is an adductor. Okay. So next slide we'll see. So this is the interarotenoid transverse part. It also will pull both the vocal cords nearer to each other. This one is also adductor. And uh, coming to the thyroarotenoid, thyroarotenoid muscle. See thyro. This is the thyro. This is the arotenoid. So thyroarotenoid. So it is a tensor as well as a adductor as well as a tensor. It ha also have a component of tensing action. Coming to the cricothyroid, this is the main tensor of the vocal cord. Okay. The vocal cord is tightly stretched and held means that is with the help of this cricothyroid. If cricothyroid has got palsied, then definitely the vocal cords will be bowy, floppy and the voice will be like that of an old man, elderly man. Okay. Now coming to the thyroepiglotticus, which is opener and interarotenoid oblique, which is closer of the larynx. Spasmodic dysphonia, if abductor spasmodic dysphonia means the muscle, abductor muscle has got into spasm, continuous contraction state. Abducted. The vocal cords are constantly abducted. When the patient is trying to speak, the vocal cords are in spasm, right? So the patient cannot speak. The air will get leaked out through the open vocal cords. So when the air gets leaked out, the patient will be having breathy voice, right? And when the adductor spasmodic dysphonia, both the vocal cords are pulled nearer to each other. Airway is uh, compromised in this case. Uh, even the patient tries to speak, strangulated voice will be there. Either cases, the treatment will be Botox injection as the pathogenesis is due to spasm of the muscles. So, antispasmodic agent, uh, Botox uh, needs to be given. Coming to the nerve supply, this is important. 
So nerve supply of the larynx is mainly by the vagus nerve of its branches. What are the branches of the vagus nerve? The recurrent laryngeal nerve as well as superior laryngeal nerve. Again, superior laryngeal nerve has got internal branch and external branch. And if you take the larynx as a whole and see, this is the level of the vocal cord. Inside the vocal, inside the larynx, above the level of the vocal cord, this is supplied by internal branch of SLN. And uh, if you take the external branch of the SLN, it supplies only cricothyroid muscle. Remaining everything is done by recurrent laryngeal. Below the level of the vocal cords, the inner sensory supply is done by RLN as well as all other intrinsic muscles. All other intrinsic muscles are supplied by your RLN. So if you remember what internal branch and external branch are doing, the remaining everything is done by RLN. Okay. So internal branch is supplying the inner mucosal surface of the larynx, inside lumen of the larynx, sensory supply to the lumen of the larynx, above the level of the vocal cords, the, whereas recurrent laryngeal below the level of the vocal cords. Now coming to motor supply movements, laryngeal movements, uh, the cricothyroid is supplied by external branch of the SLN, whereas all other muscles are supplied by the recurrent laryngeal. You can see the left side, left side RLN is having a longer course. So left side RLN will be having a, will be more prone to get damaged, right? As it is having a longer course, it has to uh, rotate around the, uh, this one, right? So uh, arch of iota, right side, around right subclavian artery. Yes. Which nerve gives sensory supply to the larynx above the glottis? You know, internal branch of the SLN. Foreign body entry into laryngeal inlet is prevented by the cough reflex, which is sluggish in alcohol ingestion, okay? So what they are asking at the laryngeal inlet, which nerve is supplied? So that is nothing but your, again, internal laryngeal nerve. All know that? Vocal cord positions, you know, central median, 1.5 mm lateral, that is paramedian, 3.5 mm lateral, that is intermediate, 7 mm slight abduction, 9 mm full abduction. And now, coming to the unilateral vocal cord palsy, so what happens in case of unilateral vocal cord palsy? So one side, both RLN and SLN are paralyzed in case of unilateral vocal cord palsy. So the paralyzed vocal cord is lying in cadaveric position. Normal side vocal cord is able to move on phonation. So the paralyzed vocal cord is lying like this. When I am trying to talk uh, phonator, the normal vocal cord is moving. But what is happening? The normal vocal cord is unable to approximate to the paralyzed vocal cord. So here what happens? There is a gap in between the two vocal cords whenever I am trying to talk. So through that gap, air leak will occur. The patient will be having breathy voice, right? Breathy voice will be there to the patient in this case. And what needs to be done here? As the vocal cord is has got lateralized, you have to push it medially. Type 1 Ishiki is thyroplasty, medialization thyroplasty you have to do. Clear? So this is about the unilateral palsy. Now coming to the bilateral palsy, what happens? Whenever bilateral RLNs has palsied, see here your SLN is intact and intact SLN, what it will do? It will, the cricothyroids, both the cricothyroids are intact. They will, they, due to their tensing action, they will pull the vocal cords from the cadaveric position to the paramedial position. So when both the vocal cords are paralyzed and are lying in paramedial position, that is just 3 mm away from each other. From the center, 1.5 mm this side and 1.5 mm that side. So 3 mm away from each other. This 3 mm gap is not sufficient for you to breathe because both are paralyzed and are lying in 3 mm away from each other. Both cannot be moved, right? So both are not moved. Both are paralyzed here. Both are fixed there. So even if you try to breathe also, through that same, through that only, the three mm gap only, you have to breathe. That is not sufficient. So patient will be gasping. This is an emergency condition and you have to go for a, immediately you have to provide the airway for instance, you have to go for a tracheostomy initially. And later on, if still, uh, even after six months, the condition is not improving, then you have to go for a lateralization type two, lateralization procedures of which your Kashima's procedure, posterior transverse chordotomy. So transversely here, I will cut the vocal cord so that the vocal cord will go like this here and it will go like this here. So this much of airway I'll be getting over here. So Kashima's procedure, posterior transverse chordotomy or complete arytenoid in this area, I can remove arytenoidectomy can be done. So these are the few types of lateralization thyroplasty, right? Now coming to Ishiki's thyroplasty, type 1, type 2, medialization, lateralization, you know, 
and coming to type 3 it is shortening and type 4 lengthening this is done in cases of puberphonia this is done in case of androphonia so in case of puberphonia what you do here what is happening a male is speaking like a female puberphonia once the adolescent stage crosses over the male the female type childish voice has to change over to male voice but in few patients that does not happen initially you have to give a speech therapy for six months even after if the patient is not developing then you have to go for a type 3 that is shortening thyroplasty there uh, uh, you also you can also uh, do a test here called as gutsman pressure test where you put pressure on your vocal cord uh, sorry on your thyroid cartilage so if you push the thyroid cartilage behind backwards what happens your vocal cords are uh, getting loosened a bit okay so that creates a male kind of voice right so that is puberphonia in case of puberphonia you go for a type 3 thyroplasty in androphonia it is exactly opposite you go for a lengthening you pull the thyroid outward and fix it uh, and that will stretch the vocal cords tense the vocal cords so the voice will be changed to high frequency female type so now uh, androphonia means female who is speaking as a male can now speak as a female so following total thyroidectomy a patient started having difficulty breathing repeated attempts to extubate were unsuccessful because vocal cords have paralyzed and are coming very near to each other due to both sides RLN injury, bilateral RLN palsy. So the most probable cause is bilateral RLN injury. Okay. Now coming to the vocal cords. See that is the structure of the vocal cords you all know. So functions of the larynx you know. Vocal cord nodules again anterior one third, posterior two third. Most common in teachers, singers, streamers, vendors. Okay. So mm -hmm. those who shout continuously for them vocal nodules are a common cause and uh, Say the, the typical area is that area. A teacher presented with complaints of hoarseness of voice on examination, bilateral swelling. Yeah, I'll be safe. No, bilateral swelling was noted on anterior one third and posterior. I'm not only a teacher, I'm an ENT teacher. No, so okay, I'll be safe only. So, uh, anterior one third and posterior two third. What is the probable diagnosis? Okay, so you all know if it is bilateral, small in size, then it is vocal nodule. Vocal polyps are mostly unilateral. They are 3 mm, more than 3 mm. Vocal nodules are less than 3 mm in size. Okay. So this is polyp. You can see one side, right? Vocal cyst also. You can see this is a vocal cyst. This is rinkis edema. You can see saddle type of a wax. You can see here, right? Okay. Vocal cords completely. Uh, mixoid elements completely gets deposited. Vocal cords gets uh, heavy like, okay? They will get heavy. And uh, even uh, short duration of talk, after a few seconds of talking, the vocal cords cannot move. The muscles won't be able to that much move that much big vocal cords. Patient will be having a, a phonetry difficulty. Okay. So this is vocal cord polyp, rinkis edema. Is this is most commonly seen in smokers? Okay. A patient with rinkis edema will have which of the following symptoms? So dysphagia is not at all related to airway. It is related to esophagus. So dysphonia is related to vocal cords. Very simple question, right? Very easy. Vocal cord granuloma, most commonly it is seen in intubation, post-intubation. Post-intubation, you see it most commonly. Okay, For posterior part, a bilobed appearance granuloma will arise posteriorly. So that is vocal cord granuloma. Vocal cord leukoplakia, this is a precancerous condition and the squamous epithelium gets converted in metaplastic and uh, gets uh, uh, stratified squamous epithelium gets deposited there and you have to remove it and you have to send for biopsy after confirmation see diplophonia one sided if one sided vocal cord is affected you will get uh, diplophonia one side i uh, lateral rectus palsy you will get diplopia right one side menius disease one side ear got infected i mean affected so diplo diplacusis hearing Two, one voice is heard as two voices. Diplophonia. One vocal cord is affected, other vocal cord is. So, affected vocal cord is vibrating with one frequency. Non, uh, normal vocal cord is uh, vibrating with one frequency. So, two voices. Diplophonia. Okay. Now, coming to the infections of the larynx, you know, acute epiglottitis. So, here you see tripod side. Patient will be sitting forward with the mouth open and breathing like that. And also, you can see thumb sign. Epiglottis will be bulged as a thumb sign, right? So thumb sign you can you can be able to see here, and uh, croup. What is croup? What sign you will see here? Steeple sign is seen in croup, right? Okay. So this is steeple sign. Why? In the subglottic area there will be huge narrowing will be there in the subglottic area. A four-year-old boy presents with low-grade fever. 
inspiratory stridor, barking cough, hoarse voice is there. Hoarse voice is there means voice is hoarse means glottis is involved. If it is acute epiglottitis, bacterial infection, it will, epiglottitis is a supraglottic infection. Vocal cords are not involved. Glottis is not involved. If the hoarse voice is there, that indicates the, the vocal cords are involved. Glottis is involved. It should be croup. Moderately inflamed uh, pharynx, increased respiratory rate, chest x-ray showed, subglottic narrowing like a st uh, steeple. So the diagnosis is croup. So here, what are, croup is a viral disease, right? So why do you want to give unnecessary antibiotic, right? So epinephrine will reduce the congestion, edema of the inner mucosal lining, improve the airway, helium oxygen mixture, same, and the dexa also steroid, it also has got the same function, right? Okay, so all of the following can cause croup to accept that this, is, this causes courage, a common cold, right? And uh, diphtheria, a grayish white pseudo membrane, you can see on the, uh, this tonsil area or even the larynx area sometimes also. Bull neck appearance due to cervical lymphadenopathy can be seen. Okay. Okay. Yeah. If fully immunized child, strep pneumonia is supposed to happen. A worried mother, six year old, unimmunized child, unimmunized child, fever, uh, cough, shortness of breath, pseudo membrane was noted while trying to remove it, bleed, bull neck appearance. So obviously, it is a diphtheria infection. This is infectious mononucleosis and this is candidiasis of the tonsils, right? And now coming to the tuberculosis, you will have a mouse nibbled, more moth-eaten appearance of the vocal cords and turban, heavily congested uh, epiglottis, edematous epiglottis, turban epiglottis, like that of a turban cap, okay? Turban epiglottis will be present. So TB treatment is again ATT. Painful phonation due to ulcerations in the vocal cord. Whenever patient tries to speak, there will be pain. Painful phonation will be seen in case of tuberculosis. Respiratory papillomatosis, HPV 6 and 11 are the most common causes. Supraglottis is the most common area. And uh, uh, treatment is by surgical debridement. Cedofovir, 13 cis retinoic acid are also used for its treatment. And uh, differences between adult and infant larynx. See, it is a cylindrical. And here it is in case of infant, it is conical. Position is high-lying larynx. This high-lying larynx will help in the infant in parallel breathing as well as sucking the milk, okay? And epiglottis is flaccid again, okay? Epiglottis is a little bit omega-shaped in case of infant. Narrowest part in case of adult is glottis at the level of the vocal cord, whereas due to conical shape, subglottis becomes the narrowest part in case of infant, okay? This you have to remember, narrowest parts you have to remember. Laryngomalacia, most common congenital anomaly. You see a omega epiglottis here and a prominent arytenoids and a floppy aryepiglottic fold. So you have to remember this omega epiglottis. Very typically, you can see this laryngomalacia, which is most common congenital anomaly, very commonly seen nowadays. So the treatment for this is again, wait and watch. Within a span of five to six months, it will become rectified. Inspiratory strider, because upper respiratory tract is involved, inspiratory strider will be present to the patient, not expiratory. And the only inspiratory strider, that too, when you stay supine, that will be more. On prone, it will be improving. After having a feed, it may increase a little bit. Uh, but of course, unless there is peripheral cyanosis, you need not act immediately. Just wait and watch. Maximum till two years of age, you can wait and watch. Even after two years, if it is not getting rectified, then you have to go for a supraglottoplasty surgery. A child is brought to you with complaints of noisy breathing, inspiratory strider, See omega shaped epiglottis. So, you know, the laryngomalacia is the most common cause. This is vocal cord paralysis, subglottic stenosis. You can see the subglottic stenosis grading, cotton mass grading, and this is laryngeal papilloma growth, right? Okay. So, coming to subglottic, you know, cotton mass grading is given. Cotton mass.
right? Connected. Yes. Yes. Oh. Yeah, there was a short power output and uh, outage and uh, okay, uh, slight disturbance. I'm sorry for that. So let us continue. So subglottic stenosis, you know, cotton mild grading, grade one is up to fifty percent and grade two, fifty one to seventy and grade three, seventy one to ninety nine and grade four is complete hundred percent. Right now, okay. Fine. So image of the drug is given below. It is used. See mitomycin C, anti-mitotic drug. So you have to use it in subglottic stenosis, right? Further growth should not occur there after surgery. So you have to use that. Cancer larynx, glottic carcinoma has got good prognosis because it is a watershed area. And also why? Because uh, the patient will be present to you, to you very fast. Very immediately the patient will present to you because a slightest change in the vocal cord will cause forces of the voice and immediately the patient will present to you. A patient presents with hoarseness of the voice, okay, hoarseness of the voice, and uh, on examination, ulcerative proliferative mass on right vocal cord. Cord is mobile means the tumor hasn't infiltrated to the surrounding structures. No lymph node involvement, no metastasis. So best is these are very highly radiosensitive tumors. Radiotherapy instead of complete laryngectomy, right? So now moving on to the supraglottic, which has got a bit low, less prognosis, subglottis. So complications after total laryngectomy, speech difficulties will be there. So speech processes like Blomsinger, Groningen, this uh, esophageal, pro this voice processes can be used to produce the voice after total laryngectomy. And uh, see the image which is shown here, the patient is using the tracheoesophageal processes so that the uh, air is being diverted from the trachea into the esophagus and then the air is coming up. As the air is coming up, the patient tries to speak. So this is uh, tracheoesophageal processes and this is electrolarynx and uh, this is artificial larynx, right? So this is a tracheostomy procedure, you know, endotracheal intubation, needle cricothyroidotomy, in between the thyroid and cricoid, you open, that is cricothyroidotomy and this is oropharyngeal goodell airway. A patient presented with surgical emphysema after an emergency tracheostomy. So uh, whenever you put a tight suture, there will be air uh, passing out will be obstructed that may creep into the surrounding tissues and it may cause surgical emphysema. You know, this is Hamlich manure, right? Okay, so coming to the pharynx, you have the pharynx, nasopharynx, oropharynx, and the, you know, wild air string. Superiorly, you have the adenoids, palatine tonsils on either side in the oropharynx. So lateral pharyngeal bands, little bit tissue scattered on the posterior pharyngeal wall. Tubal tonsils here you'll be having on the posterior part of the tongue, lingual tonsils will be there on the other side. And uh, muscles coming to the muscles, there will be longitudinal layer as well as circular layer of muscles will be there. So longitudinal will be uh, stylopharyngeus, salpingopharyngeus, and uh, uh, your <coughs> palatopharyngeus. Uh, and circular muscles will be superior constrictor, middle constrictor, inferior constrictor. And uh, Zenka's diverticulum, you all know, there is a deficit, uh, muscle deficit part in between thyropharyngeus and cricopharyngeus. Through the cricopharyngeus, uh, dysens, mucosa will come as an outpouching that is called a Zenkars diverticulum. So a 65 year old man, dysphagia, halitosis, aspiration pneumonia. So barium swallow is clearly showing a blind pouch at the back of the esophagus that is your Zenkars diverticulum. Corkscrew esophagus you see in case of diffuse esophageal spasm. Achalasia cardia, tight esophageal sphincter. So, so proximal dilatation of the esophagus. Esophageal cancer, rat tail appearance you can see here. And Dolman's procedure is done for, you all know it is Zenkars, Zenkars diverticulum. Retropharyngeal space, so a retropharyngeal abscess, you can see the soft tissue. So you can see the soft tissue here, soft tissue thickening over here on the posterior pharyngeal wall. This is a normal posterior pharyngeal wall. This is a completely abscessed posterior pharyngeal wall. So this is retropharyngeal abscess, you can see. And uh, in the retropharyngeal space, it occurs. So where is this exactly, this retropharyngeal abscess is? If you take the layer from... Uh, inward to outward. I mean, from anterior to posterior, if you go, there is the uh, layer that covers is the pharyngobasilar fascia first. Here, you will be having all the muscle layers, right? Muscles will be there posterior to the pharyngobasilar fascia. Then you will be having buccopharyngeal fascia. Behind the buccopharyngeal fascia, you will be having the retropharyngeal space, space of Gillette, okay? Right? So behind the retropharyngeal space, you will be having alar space, and then you will be having the prevertebral space. Okay. So this is about alar space is the danger space. 
prevertebral space uh, where pod spine prevertebral abscess tp pod spine can cause prevertebral abscess in this space just anterior to the vertebral bodies okay so now coming to the passivans ridge this is formed by two muscles palatopharyngeus and superior constrictor this passivans ridge cuts off the nasopharynx from the oropharynx during swallowing and prevents nasal regurgitation right and adenoids so these are present in the nasopharynx and hypertrophy of the adenoid will cause mouth breathing nose block mouth breathing snoring in a young child so this is the adenoid phase persistent adenoid hypertrophy will cause high arched palate open mouth dull look face so all these features you can see a uh, very mild nasolabial fold pinched nose crowded upper teeth a protruding maxillary teeth okay so all those you can see five year old girl see complaints of mouth breathing expressionless face okay high arched palate crowded upper teeth this is typically you can see the white color is showing your white star is showing your adenoid hypertrophy black star is showing your tonsil hypertrophy okay fine these are the uh, lingual tonsils you can see the quincy peritonsillar abscess school child history of a uh, uh, recurrent urti mouth breathing impaired hearing high arched palate again the treatment here is the patient is also having impaired hearing serous otitis media so adenoidectomy with the grommet insertion to drain the middle ear fluid and improve the hearing serous otitis media is also there so impaired hearing is there so you have to go for grommet insertion also fine seven year old child post tonsillectomy complaining of snoring palpitations mouth breathing decrease in hearing high arched palate so Again, here the treatment will be adenoidectomy with grommet insertion. This is a nasopharyngeal mirror, seeing the nasopharyngeal contents. Arytenoids will be seen in a laryngeal mirror, right? So, this is a B type tympanogram showing serous otitis media in a six year old boy. So, the high arched palate, recurrent URTI, that is again indicating adenoid hypertrophy. Again, the treatment will be adenoidectomy with grommet insertion. Tonsil hypertrophy. See, the bed of the tonsil is formed by superior constrictor. Remember this point. Bed of the tonsil is formed by superior constrictor muscle and glossopharyngeal. Your glossopharyngeal ninth cranial nerve is related to the superior constrictor muscle. Which of the following conditions does not form a gray white membrane? See, streptococcal will form, diphtheria will form. Ludwig's angina is a submandibular space abscess, not related to tonsils, right? So, this is streptococcal, diphtheria, pseudo membrane, you can see, and infectious mononucleus also you can see. And uh, uh, main arterial supply is the tonsillar branch of the facial artery. Remember this point. Majority blood supply to the tonsils is from this uh, uh, tonsillar branch of the facial artery. So, surgical position during tonsillectomy is Rose's position. This is Boyle Davis mouth gag, and this is tonsillar snare, Eve's tonsillar snail. These are Draffin's bipods. Okay. And uh, a patient post tonsillectomy starts bleeding from the operative side. Immediate management, shift to OT. What's happening here? See, there are three types of hemorrhages. Primary hemorrhage means during the surgery itself. Then next, reactionary hemorrhage means within the first 24 hours. So here, reactionary hemorrhage is happen happening. Shift to OT, remove the clots and cauterize or ligate the vessel. And uh, the secondary, secondary bleeding means it is after the patient discharges, there will be bleeding at the home due to Again, infection of the tonsillar fossa, inappropriate use of the antibiotics. Now, just give antibiotics, most of the times that will be enough. Which of the nerves is responsible for ear pain? That is your glossopharyngeal now. Just now we have seen. Okay. Coming to JNA, you know, this is more exclusively in adolescent males. Exclusively seen in adolescent males, right? A 16-year-old male, recurrent epistaxis. Adolescent male, recurrent epistaxis. Typical presentation in case of JNA. Management will be always surgical excision. Never attempt a needle poking, FNAC, biopsy, never do. It is a vascular tumor. Radiotherapy has got no role here. And a 14-year-old male, recurrent epistaxis, no trauma, nasal obstruction, rhinorrhea, firm published mass. So, a 14-year-old male, recurrent epistaxis. Catchwords, these are all the catchwords. So, it will be JNA, right? 14-year-old player, football player, 14-year-old football player. Again, epistaxis, no history of trauma. So, recurrent spontaneous nasal bleed. Okay. So, CCT, you can see here. The posterior wall of the maxillary sinus is going anteriorly. This sign you call it as Hallman Miller sign, right? Okay. 20 year old male, again, 20 year old male, unilateral nasal obstruction, recurrent bleeding. Okay. CECT ex reveals mass extending from posterior cornea to nasopharynx. Again, nasopharyngeal angiofibroma, right? Which one of the, which one of the investigations you do in nasopharyngeal angiofibroma? 
CT with contrast because it is a vascular tumor. You need to know the contrast uptake is present or not. If the uptake is present, it is a vascular tumor. It should be JNA. Biopsy is contraindicated. FNAC, chemo radiation has got no role here. NPC, you know, we have already discussed much about NPC, right? Identify the structure marker too. You know, this is Fosa of Rosenmuller, most common site of your nasopharyngeal. Passive which is altogether a different one, you know. Sinus of Morgagni is present between skull base, superior constrictor, middle constrictor, and inferior constrictor. Here, in between, the contents will be going through the sinus of Morgagni, right? Your eustachian tube will be going in between the skull base and the superior constrictor muscle. In between superior and middle constrictor, ninth cranial nerve will be there. Middle and inferior, tenth cranial nerve will be lying. Passive which you know, it cuts off the nasopharynx from oropharynx and prevents the nasal regurgitation of the swallowed food. Rathke's pouch is a congenital persistent abnormality. 60-year-old male, painless cervical lymphadenopathy, unilateral conductive hearing loss, decreased mobility of the soft palate due to vagal nerve involvement. So that should be your nasopharyngeal carcinoma, right? And uh, which of the following is a part of trotus triad, you know, conductive hearing loss, ipsilateral temporoparietal neuralgia, palatal paralysis. Uh, so all these are parts of your trotus triad. Now coming to the Quincy, so unilateral, most of the times unilateral, peritonsillar space abscess, just behind the tonsil, and the superior constrictor in between the tonsil and its bed superior constrictor abscess gets collected that is peritonsillar abscess you call it as severe pain difficulty swallowing trismus will be there to the patient so definitely immediately you have to go for incision and drainage first initially drain the abscess wait for 15 days and then go for tonsillectomy this is you call it as interval tonsillectomy okay so this is your quincy and Ludwig's angina, submandibular space abscess, it is the most common seen in dental caries. Okay, I think oral thrush, after ulcers, you can, ankyloglossia, this is tongue tie. Okay, oral submucous fibrosis, you know, it's a precancerous condition where uh, beetle nut, uh, tobacco chewing people will get this. Mouth opening will be restricted. Fibrous tissue deposition, collagen fibers deposit under the mucosal layer that will restrict the opening of the mouth opening. Ranula, this is sublingual gland. Swelling, right? And uh, this leukoplakia, precancerous. Erythroplakia, also precancerous. 17 times more malignant than leukoplakia. Mums first starts as unilateral, then may become bilateral. So it's an acute uh, viral pyrotitis, right? Pyrotid swelling will be there. Nowadays, mums is also endemic here. The treatment will be steroids, okay? Corticosteroids can be given. And uh, so it's a self-limiting disease also. But apart from parotitis, myocarditis, thyroiditis, and arthritis, or uphoritis can be there. So check for those and treat accordingly. Cialolithiasis is most common in submandibular than parotid because the secretions are thick and mucus in submandibular as well as the secretion has to up ascend up against the gravity, whereas from the parotid, the secretions will go down according to the gravity. Pleomorphic adenoma, most common benign tumor of the uh, parotid gland. So most common occurs at the superficial layer, the tail of the parotid. Uh, a hard painless mass in a 40-year-old female typically presents uh, the pneumorphic adenoma. Adenolymphoma, it's a warthin tumor, second most common benign tumor. So here lymphoid elements will be seen. Mucoepidermoid, <coughs> sorry, mucoepidermoid carcinoma, most malignant tumor of the uh, parotid gland. So more the epidermoid component, more is the malignancy. Again, surgical excision is the treatment of choice. And so followed by, if the margins are positive, not required, margins are negative, then radiotherapy required. Adenoid cystic carcinoma, perineural infiltration is most commonly seen here. So a patient presents with a firm, tender, slow-growing mass below the ear. So the it is definitely in the area of the parotid. So it is a parotid abscess, redness, tenderness, swelling everywhere you can see. And this is a minor salivary gland tumor on the, I mean, uh, retention cyst that have most ha commonly happens in the lower lip area. So it is a not a retention cyst of major salivary glands. Major means parotid, submandibular, sublingual. Here, uh, apart from your major salivary glands, few minor salivary glands are scattered all over the mucosa of the uh, buccal mucosa. So most common site you see in case of lower lip. Uh, it is a retention cyst of the minor salivary glands and treatment is always surgical resection. Okay. So I have to run in the end a little bit. Fine. Uh, but uh, hopefully uh, we have completed and uh, I will share the annotated PDF. Okay, you can go through that. Fine. Okay, maybe your dermasar is waiting. I have took 20 minutes more. Fine. So, so thank you all.